Are there any constituency statements by honourable members? I call the member for Wakefield. Uh, well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. It's my great pleasure uh, to uh, talk uh, today about the 150th uh, anniversary of the Kapunda Football Club, the Bombers, uh, from my hometown uh, and a, a club I played uh, just the single season of under-17s uh, football. It was a pretty uh, desperate year for the town to have to draft uh, a player like myself. Um, not, the mo not the best footballer, but I, I did play in uh, 1989. Uh, we won one game all year uh, against Gawler Central, so I always cherish uh, going uh, to Gawler Central Oval uh, and reminiscing about uh, that single uh, victory that year. Our coach, Ducky Ryan, talked a bit about uh, that year at, um, on the night. But uh, the Cabanda Bombers, one of uh, the oldest clubs, certainly in South Australia, 150 years. Uh, this is a great book by Paul McCarthy, uh, my old uh, Year 12 legal studies uh, teacher and someone, I think, who uh, first just told me about this parliament, taught me about uh, the way our government was structured and, I think, uh, something of an inspiration uh, to come here, although I know he would uh, be somewhat distressed about me saying that uh, because he, he doesn't like uh, uh, receiving praise. Uh, but he and uh, Danny Menzel did a great job on the night, I think, of describing this, the, the Kapunda uh, Bombers' uh, great history, uh, its uh, treasured role in my hometown. And it's, uh, you know, like so many uh, country uh, towns, uh, you know, social life, uh, your weekends revolve around uh, the footy and the netball. And certainly this is the case in Kapunda. Uh, I lived across from Dutton Park and every Saturday morning it was a, a hive of activity. Uh, and so it's just, it was a really great night. Uh, four or 500 people at the Kapunda trotting track. Uh, it did get a bit cold uh, towards the end of the evening, but uh, everybody really enjoyed it. I should uh, also pay tribute to Matt Ryan, the club president, and to Andrew Hollis Hayward, who uh, was the MC, and the many other speakers on the night. And I should uh, uh, pay tribute to uh, Kapunda's uh, greatest uh, football player, Jack Dermody, who's described in this book, also a, a, a state captain uh, and uh, a great champion of the Port uh, Power, or Port Adelaide uh, footy club, as it was then uh, constituted. Uh, it was a great night, and this is a great club, and uh, I'd look forward uh, to going uh, maybe in another 10 years' time or another 20 years' time uh, to another anniversary. Uh, dinner where we've got uh, even more history to put in this great book, uh, First Use of the Ball, uh, which describes uh, all of Kapunda's achievements uh, over those years since it uh, was first founded. I thank the member for Wakefield and call the member for Ryan. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I rise today to recognise and pay tribute to all the aspiring young sporting stars in my electorate of Ryan and to highlight the ways our government is encouraging participation in sport and assisting these young athletes to meet their goal. Involvement in sport has always been a way of life in Australia, but with the rise in technology, we're seeing a decline in young Australians' physical activity. There are a number of ways our government is encouraging active living and participation in sport, as well as assistance for young people to ensure they can achieve their goals. The Australian government allocates $3.14 million annually to the local sporting champions program for grants of $500 to successful applicants. These grants can be put towards the cost of travel, accommodation, uniforms or equipment. The most recent local sporting champions in my electorate include Austin Callaghan and Ethan Zealy for cricket, Callum McCarthy, Carly Hess and Jaden Lilly for athletics, Connor Adcott and Caelan Birchman for hockey, Lachlan Donchak for rowing, Ryan Woodrow baseball, Connor Leggett skiing and Dominic Field in swimming. Congratulations to these athletes. They are to be commended for such dedication and commitment. Madam Deputy Speaker, another Ryan local achieving her sporting dreams is Charlotte Van Gerwen, who is with us in the chamber today. Ryan, uh, Charlotte's chosen sport is diving and she recently moved to the ACT from my electorate for her father's job but I'm told she will back to be back to represent Ryan and Queensland next year. Charlotte represented the ACT at the Pacific School Games in Adelaide in November 2015 and was also selected to represent the ACT at the National Schools Competition. Charlotte's long-term goal is the Tokyo Olympics in 2020 
and I wish her the best of luck and we'll be all cheering for her. Madam Deputy Speaker, we have some excellent sporting and aspiring athletes, and the federal government is committed to continuing Australia's reputation as a great sporting nation. We're doing this with two initiatives. The hashtag Girls Make You Move campaign encourages young Australian women to exercise and be physically active. And the Sporting Schools program, which is part of the coalition government's preventative health initiative, aims to get more students involved in physical activity. Many schools in my electorate of Ryan are taking part, and I'm sure we will see the development of many more up and coming young athletes like the ones I have mentioned. While we're on the subject of aspiring sports stars, I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate some of the members of the Ryan electorate who have qualified for the 2016 Australian Olympic swimming team. Marty Wilson, Jake Packard, Bronte Barrett, and Kate and Bronte Campbell. I wish them all the best for success in Rio. I thank the member for Ryan, and I congratulate Charlotte too. Good luck for you for next year. And I'd like to call the member for Canberra. Canberra. <laughs> That's all right. I beg your pardon, Deputy right. Chair. Deputy Chair, what Canberra has seen from this budget is what we've seen from Liberal government budgets for the last 20 years. Prime Minister Turnbull's budget for Canberra is one that would make his predecessors proud. He's learned from former Prime Minister John Howard's cuts from 1996. He has used the disastrous 1996 budget, not as a warning, but as a template. We have faced cuts upon cuts upon cuts. Cuts to Medicare, cuts to universities, cuts to pathology, cuts to family payments, and those cuts are felt around the country. But some of the deepest cuts have been reserved for Canberra, Deputy Speaker. Some of the Turnbull government's most significant cuts are targeting my constituents. The Prime Minister and the Treasurer are out in the media telling everyone who will listen to that their budget is a plan for growth and jobs. It's a bitter irony for Canberra, Deputy Speaker, because when it comes to the Liberal government's plans for Canberra, it's a plan to cut jobs, it's a plan to store growth, it's the economic plan you roll out when you have no economic plan. Now, this Liberal government has packed their budget with gifts for them and their mates, and they've asked Canberra to pick up the tab. Once again, Canberra is being forced to find billions of dollars worth of savings. Compare this government's record in Canberra to that of Labor, Deputy Speaker. Labor invested in trade training centres right throughout the ACT. Labor invested in hospitals. Labor invested in every school in Canberra. Labor invested in major road projects like the Majura Parkway. You compare that to the Prime Minister and his Liberal government. The Liberal government that has just cut $1.9 billion from the public service. Deputy Speaker, they are not investing in Canberra. They are cutting. They're not cutting fat. They're not cutting bone. They are hitting vital organs. But don't tell them, Deputy Speaker, don't tell them that. The Liberals are out there saying that this is a good budget for Canberra. How they can say that, God only knows. What makes them say that, Deputy Speaker? Because it's not nearly the $2 billion worth of cuts. It's not the thousands of jobs being cut. It's not the lack of prioritisation of the NBN rollout. We've got some of the worst speeds in the country, Deputy Speaker, here, just 25 kilometres from Parliament House. It's not the cuts to our national institutions. No, the reason that they think this is a good budget for Canberra is because they had the good manners, manners to include $300,000 in terms of a consolation prize, $1.9 billion in savings, cuts to the public service, and what do we get in return? $300,000. Now, that is the only good news for Canberra in this budget from this government, and they think that that's enough. It's an offensive underscore to this government's persistent hostility to Canberra. It seems like no matter who leads this opposition, old habits die hard. I thank the member for Canberra and I call the member for Lindsay. Well, after that very positive contribution, I would actually like to start my address today by acknowledging the presence of Peter Rose, who's here today. And I'd like to thank you, Peter, for your contribution and service that you've provided so many in the parliament and you will be missed. Uh, your stewardship and your minister will be well missed here. So thank you for your service. <laughs> Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise today to talk to you about the future of jobs right across our country. What the budget means for the people of Western Sydney, in particular my part of Western Sydney, which is Lindsay. 
Our part of Western Sydney is changing at a rate of knots. It's time for our region to reimagine our potential as to what we can be. That is what I think is so exciting about this budget. This budget goes through a suite of infrastructure projects that's going to enable our region to get to its feet and start moving. Since the Abbott government initially brought uh, forward for our region $3.6 billion of infrastructure, we have now seen the unemployment rate of my region dropped to 4.36 per cent, well below the Sydney, New South Wales and Australian average. In fact, that, in that unemployment rate has dropped over the past 12 months by 2.37 per cent, or 2,500 jobs for the people of Lindsay. This is great, great news. The Turnbull government is now going further with our innovation boom, with the way that we are now looking to unlock the potential of the innovation corridor, a master plan that really came from the, the brain of Barney Glover, a brilliant academic and a brilliant leader of Western Sydney University, where we will see many thousands of smart jobs move to Western Sydney. Sydney Science Park, 12,000 jobs, 10,000 research positions and the first STEM school in the country. We will be supporting these growth, this growth and these developments in this budget with continual upgrades to stage one of Mulgoa Road, which of course is the element of Mulgoa Road outside Penrith Council there between Union Road and the, and the Fire Museum. North Connex will, will move the M1 that will connect to the M2. That will be great for people travelling north. Of course, West Connex will enable people getting from Parramatta to the city much, much quicker. The Western Sydney Infrastructure Plan will see the Warrington Arterial built and, of course, the upgrade of the Northern Road from Brinjelly, or sorry, from Norellan all the way through to the hospital at the Great Western Highway. The Western Sydney Airport Infra uh, Foundation Works will see $115 million to start the preparatory work there and the commencement of the rail box so that we can ensure that into the future we will also be connected by rail right across our region. And finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, the work that this government has done with the New South Wales Baird government in regard to asset recycling will see massive work done to the metropolitan part of the Western Line, which will increase capacity and improve efficiency of our region. That means you can get to the city quicker. That means you can get to your jobs quicker. I'd like to thank the government for their work, and I'd like to see you all out there in the hustings very soon. Okay, I thank the member for Lindsay, and I call the member for Laidall. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Well, it's two days after the budget and the details are becoming clearer. First of all, we need to note that um, this government's budget uh, has, includes income tax cuts that will see income tax cuts to one in five in my community, Deputy Speaker, one in five. But the kicker, the kicker comes with the cuts to incomes that will go with it, the cuts to the family tax benefit, the cuts to the school kids bonus that will see those families worse off under this government. And even those families who are earning over 80,000 a year uh, who may receive some form of income tax cut will be hit again by the family tax benefit cuts, the school kids bonus cuts. The whole country will be hit by a billion dollar cut in infrastructure, Deputy Speaker. This economic plan that those opposite are claiming is actually going to entrench unfairness for 10 years, an uncosted 10 years, we might add. So we're calling it a budget. Those opposite are insisting on calling it an economic plan. Well, it's an economic plan that entrenches unfairness, Deputy Speaker. It brings with it cuts to health, estimates this morning of $14 per doctor visit. Now, I know how Australia reacted to a GP tax of $7 per doctor visit. I wonder how they'll be reacting in their homes this morning when they read that it could be $14 upfront to see a doctor. And that's without talking about the pathology cuts and the increases that families will see. We know it includes enormous cuts to education. We know it includes an attack on Medicare, Deputy Speaker. We know that this government is incensed with the Americanisation of our health system, and we find this morning they are going to continue to pursue the Americanisation of our higher education system, Deputy Speaker. These are things that the Australian public has already rejected, Deputy Speaker, but they insist. I was not surprised this morning to hear former Prime Minister John Howard had suggested that, uh, that the member for Warringah would go out and sell this budget around the country. Well, good luck with that. He tried to sell the 2014 budget. He tried to sell the 2015 budget. Those opposite removed him from office. 
but now he'll be out around the traps selling this 2016 budget that backs in all of the cuts, all of the cuts. Deputy Speaker, there are some this morning who are claiming that Labor is talking about envy. This is not envy, Deputy Speaker, and the people in my community know it. They know that I stand here an advocate for fairness, an advocate for opportunity, an advocate for a fair Australian system that sees every child in every school given the opportunities that they deserve, something those opposites seem to fail, fail to understand. Labor will put people first, Deputy Speaker. Labor will put people first. I thank the member for Laylaw and I call the member for Menzies. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, last week I had the pleasure uh, and the opportunity of attending Don Care's annual community showcase at the Veneto Club in Berlin uh, in my electorate. Uh, Don Care is the major community welfare agency in Manningham and in the Menzies electorate. It's served for many years the youth, uh, the disabled, the aged and others who are vulnerable in uh, different circumstances um, throughout the city. It was a pleasure to be there with the chairman of the board, Tony Monley, uh, the director of Don Care, Doreen Stoves, uh, their patron, Rosie Batty, and along with some of the professional staff and some of the more than 500 volunteers who give their time uh, to this agency. In fact, this is a unique agency in that it has a hybrid uh, arrangement of professional staff and many, many volunteers from the local community who provide their time and effort into helping others within the community. Uh, one of their programs at the moment is I Matter, uh, which is a relationship program particularly aimed at young people, and its aim is to help young people to build self-esteem, uh, respect and resilience, to prevent violence and to promote healthy relationships by raising awareness and creating change around societal pressures and social attitudes, identifying potential risks to relationships, uh, looking at uh, problems in including abusive behaviours and understanding the dynamics of what makes a healthy relationship. And uh, it was a pleasure through the community, Stronger Communities program to be able to provide some funding for um, some iPads, which will be part of the training process for this. So I thank all those who are involved in Don Care. I particularly like to mention the sponsors, the Bendigo Bank uh, of East Doncaster and Templestowe, the Silverstone Volvo dealership in Doncaster, uh, the Veneto Club in Bulleen that have uh, made Doncare their major charitable activity uh, for this year, uh, and in addition to that, the ongoing support of the Manningham City Council that was represented at the event last week by the Deputy Mayor, Councillor Dot Haynes, uh, and other members of the Council. This is a wonderful organisation and deserves the ongoing support of the people uh, in my electorate. Uh, in the remaining uh, moments to me, Deputy Speaker, can I add my note of best wishes to the Reverend Peter Rose? Uh, I've known Peter for a long time. Uh, he's been uh, the chaplain here, as I recall, for about a decade now, and uh, will be retiring at the end of uh, this particular parliament. Peter, can I say on my behalf, and I'm sure on behalf of many others that you have interacted with uh, over your period of time here, uh, a, a very profound and sincere thank you for your presence, um, for your counsel, um, for your wise words, and for your listening ear uh, on many occasions. Thank you very much. God bless and good luck. I thank the member for Menzies and call the member for Cryo. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And maybe I'll start uh, where the member for Menzies left and add my uh, words of heartfelt appreciation to Reverend Peter Rose and wish you all the best for the, the future. Um, your presence in this building makes uh, an enormous difference and someone to talk to in difficult times uh, is certainly something that I've experienced, so good luck. Um, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, if you're experiencing troubles uh, downloading onto your computer, if it's taking hours, if the excitement of getting Netflix is turning into the experience of watching buffering on your TV, well, everyone can blame the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister was a failure as the Communications Minister, and his second-rate NBN is a complete mess. He promised the entire country that the NBN would be rolled out this year, and yet only 83 per cent of the, uh, uh, rather 83 per cent of the country are still waiting for this second rate MBN to arrive. The cost of the second rate MBN has doubled. 
The time taken to build it has doubled, and in that time Australia has dropped from being the 30th uh, in the world in terms of internet speeds down to the 60th. By any definition, this is a disaster. Uh, what in 2013 the then communications minister said would cost $29.5 billion, uh, today the cost is something like $56 billion for the second rate NBN. And the, and the rollout will not occur until 2020. In Geelong, this is particularly felt given that Labor's planned fibre optic rollout was one of the first things cancelled by this government. And what was replaced in the electorates of Corio and Corangamite was the plan for the second rate MBN, of which we are all still waiting, which means that in suburbs like Bell Park, Bell Post Hill, in my electorate, they're still waiting for the MBN. East Geelong, the city, Geelong West, South Geelong, all waiting for the MBN. From Lara to Leopold, from Chilwell to Corio, everyone is waiting for the MBN. And the same is the case across the river in Corangamite, in suburbs like Grovedale, Heighton, Belmont, Marshall. Uh, Wandana Heights, all of these are waiting for the NBN. What's amazing is that the member for Corangamite is actually running on the delivery of the NBN. Indeed, there is a sign that she's put up reputedly, some say, at the cost of $40,000 a month in Warren Ponds, a suburb which doesn't have the NBN, um, saying that uh, Sarah Henderson is delivering NBN fast broadband to Geelong. That is an amazing statement to make. There is an old adage which says that Nothing kills a bad product quicker than good advertising. Uh, when, people, uh, when you make people aware of that which they, about that which they are grumpy, they become even grumpier. And so what we say to the member for Corangamite is keep rolling out the NBN signs because you're certainly doing a better job at that than rolling out the NBN itself. Uh, Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister was a failure in this regard. Only a Labor government can fix this, and the 2nd of July will provide that opportunity. I thank the member for Cryo, and I call the member for Macmillan. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I'm here to place on record my thanks. My thanks to the Transport Office, to Greg, Maureen, Joy, Jessica, Judy, Catherine and John, and I won't tell you which ones are my favourites, uh, to the Reverend Peter Rose, who is retiring this day, our parliamentary chaplain, to David Elder, our speaker, our, our, um, uh, our clerk, and those clerks that have gone before him in my time, Lynn Barlin, Ian Harris and Bernard Wright, uh, to our clerks' teams, the deputy clerk, Clarissa Surtees, in my particular case, and for the help she's given me, ministerial staff and government liaison officers, the whips office and their staff, the attendants, Luce and his, Luch and his team in the chamber, uh, the library, angels of knowledge and accuracy, uh, ably headed up by Diane Herriot, the cleaners, the gardeners, the catering staff, Tim in the parliamentary dining room, the Hansard staff, our telephone operators, uh, the committee staff and support, our security team and particularly the AFP. My fellow parliamentarians, those that are staying on to the next parliament and those that are leaving, when this place changes and when you leave, the personalities will change and the parliament will change and it won't be the same without you. Uh, to my, uh, to the uh, speaker and deputy speakers and all the deputy speakers that have uh, uh, given their time and effort on our behalf, can I say to uh, my staff, Jennifer and Prue, who make sure I'm in the right place at the right time in this house, they are angels of my own. Uh, to Cynthia Cotton, my landlady, uh, who has been um, a special blessing to me for the last four years and four months. She's now moving on to greater things in a new part of a new stage in her life, and I just want to wish Cynthia all the best in the changes that are to come. Uh, so I say uh, to this parliament, uh, we can't do our job here without the staff and support we get. And I've seen criticisms of the, uh, of the benefits that accrue to members of parliament by the support they get from around this building at odd times in papers that want to make a push about uh, the facilities that we are given here. The facilities we are given here uh, are a real gift to us in that uh, that gift enables us to do our job in this place and on behalf of our constituents. And we really appreciate all the support that surrounds us. So I say to the parliament today, I wish those that are leaving, and there's one here today, Joy, um, Jill, um, the, with the best yet to come, with the best yet to come for you and all of your people who are leaving the parliament by choice. And can I say, with the best yet to come, and thank God I was born in this great South land, uh, this great nation, Australia, that we have. Uh, we're a wealthy nation with so much to give. We have some problems to sort out, 
and together in the new parliament we'll sort those problems. I thank the member for Macmillan and call the member for Shortland. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and thank you, uh, Member for Macmillan. Madam Deputy Speaker, one of the issues that um, I've been confronted with in Shortland elected is the delays that uh, my, my constituents have been experiencing with the processing of Medicare claims, or to be quite honest with you, to actually even contacting Medicare to be able to lodge a claim. And when those claims are lodged, a number of them uh, are defaulted, um, or, and, and I'm reliably advised that 40 per cent of online services are unsuccessful. Now, I just want to quickly cite um, two particular cases here. Uh, one is uh, Bob Irvine from Swansea, and he made the mistake of travelling to Belmont to the Belmont Medicare office the day after it had been closed by uh, this government. Since that time, he has been trying to lodge his claim, both online and by telephone. He wrote to me on, uh, in the beginning of April saying that he had great success. He'd actually got through to the Medicare line, only, only to be told that we're experiencing large volumes uh, and cannot take your call. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I know that my constituents aren't the only ones experiencing this problem. The system's flawed, the system's not working, and constituent after constituent is being disadvantaged. It's particularly bad in Shortland electorate because we have a number of older people living there, and uh, it is just totally unacceptable that we have a situation where 40 per cent of all incoming calls result from failures of an online service. And, and I think that the government needs to actually deal with this. Now, I'm just putting another one from a different perspective. Here's a doctor who's unable to um, claim the money that he's entitled to uh, he, because uh, part of it's private health, part of it's Medicare. Can't claim the private health part until such time as the Medicare components complain, com, complete it. The Medicare complain, component can't be com, completed because there's too many delays at Medicare. The system's flawed, so this doctor's missing out on two sets of payment, the Medicare payment and the private health insurance payment, because the private health insurance can't, can't complete um, the claim. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, I call on this government to actually fix this flawed system. I thank the member for Shortland and call the member for Clare. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Look to uh, to my staff, my uh, the peop various people who ran my office over the years: Ev, Pinky, Melissa, Anne, uh, and my current staff like Kathy and Gordon, John McDonald I had for years, uh, and uh, Bernice, Anthony, and Kylie, who all said I'd never remember them. I remember you. <laughs> Look. Uh, I, I also need to say something I meant to say when I delivered a report yesterday, and that's how wonderful the secretariats are uh, in the committees here. Um, Peggy and her staff, and uh, Ashley and the rest of them, and the environment, who, who, who were our secretariat for the environment uh, committee, were just so professional and so good that on behalf of the committee and the parliament, I thank them and their colleagues who I've always found I hadn't actually been involved in committee work for something like 10 years until I took over this committee recently. I'd forgotten just how very good they are, and I thank them. Look, uh, in my very first speech here, I talked about the injustices on agriculture by green groups and governments. And so I think it's pretty fitting I finish up the same way. And I have been long a critic of what Senator Robert Hill did when he introduced the EPBC Act. Not in the Act, but in the fact he misled us to believe it did not give a federal government the power to override states in some circumstances. And it most certainly does, and is most certainly quite draconian. And I would say that uh, 
the member for Watson and his time in the environment minister did not make it any less so. But I cannot believe, Deputy Speaker, that here, with all the state laws we've seen, New South Wales, who went so hard, uh, it's not surprising the current government has looked at make it actually workable for agriculture. Queensland, I remember warning a mate of mine in Queensland when he bought country uh, over the uh, over the McIntyre River. I said, if you're going to clear, may do it now. Oh, he said, they won't interfere. I said, they will. He did clear it and he thanked me profusely because 12 months later he couldn't have. But in the same way, Queensland is re-looking what a previous government had done and mitigated those laws, then New South Wales has to do the same thing. The last thing Australian agriculture needs is for the federal government to dream up laws to get on top of state laws on native vegetation. Because, by God, they're bad enough now. They do not allow agriculture to look after the thing they treasure most of their land. And there is nobody, Deputy Speaker, more interested in leaving their land better than they find it than farmers who, more often than not, pass it on to their own children. Stand up for them. Don't screw them. I thank the member for Clare and call the member for Melbourne Port. Thank you very much. Avshalom Shmulovic, the son of the Mukhtar of Kastiel, uh, better known as Saul Same, came to Australia in, uh, uh, from British mandated Palestine in 1918. He became, uh, uh, and his family became farmers in West Australia, uh, where they still have uh, a property. And um, Saul later, uh, as the Second World War commenced, joined the RAAF uh, and uh, uh, was training pilots in the far north of uh, West Australia when uh, uh, he was called back to his family uh, business, Glowweave, which became, of course, uh, the king of the textile industry in Melbourne in the 1950s, 60s and 70s, and, of course, the main um, advertiser on, in Melbourne tonight, probably the best-known um, best uh, textile business, clothing business in Australia of that era. Of course, Mr Same was a, a, a person of whom former Prime Minister said, a man of pure heart. He was a labour man through and through who cared deeply for social justice and less fortunate in the community. He was a man who matched his passion with action, donating, donating large amounts of his personal wealth to philanthropic causes. Um, and of course, <clears throat> my dear friend, uh, uh, Mr Beasley, recently recalled the famous uh, functions that would take place the Sunday before every election uh, at his home in Armidale, uh, where um, <clears throat> uh, we were, we were to all to give what uh, former Prime Minister Keating called the tennis court oath. These, uh, these functions enabled the Labor Party in the years before matching funding to, uh, to operate, uh, were never reported by the media and were probably some of the most significant political events on our side of politics in Australia. And it's, of course, for that reason that um, uh, in the very large condolence notice that I had caused to be published, four prime ministers of Australia, Gillard, Rudd, Keating, Hawke, together with opposition leaders, Beasley and Crean, uh, all signed his bereavement notice. <coughs> um, as Mark Dreyfus said of uh, Saul Same, uh, while success itself is not an uncommon experience, for those who are lucky enough to live in Australia, success is rarely achieved with such grace and is rarely shared with such generosity as it was by Saul Same. I consider myself extremely lucky to have known Saul for the years that I did. He was always good, to, gave me good counsel, and he did so with a disarming warmth and wit. I learnt a great deal from Saul, and I'll miss him greatly. I sat next to him for the last 10 years of his life, every Saturday in the Elwood Synagogue. Um, the wisdom that was uh, imparted, uh, the generosity of spirit, uh, the stories of Australian public life, business um, and politics uh, are, are legion. Uh, he should uh, uh, have a, a very blessed memory as a great uh, citizen of Australia and an example of the success of migrants who come to this country and put everything into it, from his service in the RAF to his membership I, I, of the Qantas board. The member's time has expired. I thank the member for Melbourne Ports and call the member for Page. Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, thank you. Madam Deputy Speaker, Casino is the beef capital of Australia, Madam Deputy Speaker. Others claim it, they're delusional. You're a friend of mine, Madam Deputy Speaker. You're a colleague of mine. You're the member for Capricornia, which takes in Rockhampton, which you unfortunately and very sadly think is the beef capital of Australia. Madam Deputy Speaker, you're wrong and you know it. 
Coming up in a few weeks' time, Madam Deputy Speaker, is Beef Week in Casino. It's a very exciting annual event. Celebrations kick off on May the 22nd and will continue for 11 days with more than 100 events, including the legendary crowning of the Beef Week Queen and Mr Beef. This year's potential queens are Chelsea Law, Michaela Thomas, Lucy Amy, Olivia Hooton, Georgie King, Madeleine Mayer, Alice Magna, Holly Miller and Angelique Dillon. And of course there is gender equity with Mr Beef, which will happen later in the week. The fun doesn't end there. We have Beef Meets Reef at Evans Head, um, a street parades, breakfast with the butchers, rodeos, busking, um, the Beef Week races and the ever popular Cow Pat Lotto. I thank the organising committee again. A lot of work goes into putting this event on um, and again they've done a great year. I thank the committee Stuart George, um, Frank McKee, Belinda Dockrell, John Hamilton, uh, Grant Shedden, Sarah Yeo, Sam Chilton and Cherie Holdsworth. And again, sponsors are very important for this too, Madam Deputy Speaker. I thank the Northern Cooperative Meat Company, the Richmond Valley Council, Casino RSM, West Lawn, Tursa, Richmond Dairies, 2LM, Triple Z, NBN, The Land, Richmond River Express and the Northern Star. Madam Deputy Speaker, you know it and I know it. Casino, the beef capital of Australia. Madam Deputy Speaker, tomorrow I am attending a Mother's Day morning tea organised by the Lower Clarence Maclean Women's Auxiliary. This is an annual event organised to give those mothers who are on their own an opportunity to celebrate the day. The Women's Auxiliary do a wonderful job raising money for the Maclean Hospital to purchase much needed equipment. They do this through raffles, functions like the Mother's Day morning tea, staffing a, a trolley throughout the hospital five days a week and selling papers, lollies, magazines, etc. to patients. They do a fantastic job of helping others. The Auxiliary have a total of 107 members. The Executive Committee of Rhonda Shaw, Rita Nutt, Sandra Bradbury, Edie Quick, Margaret Anand, Anand um, Alita Morley and Janine Adams, I thank you. They have a lot of long-standing members. This financial year they've raised $107,000. 75 has already been spent. They have, the hospital has a wish list, list of which the auxiliary continue to fill and I thank them for their service. I thank the member for Page and I'd just like to correct him of Rockhampton being the beef capital of Australia. <laughs> <laughs> and I call the member for call. Deputy Speaker, Deputy Speaker, I recently raised my grievance in this chamber about the manner in which some of my most vulnerable and disadvantaged constituents were treated by the private provider Keystone College prior to its closure in February of this year. Keystone College was a registered training organisation which was approved to offer vet fee help funding. Unfortunately, the situation in which the staff and students of Keystone College found themselves in is becoming an increasingly common occurrence. All too often we have seen private, for-profit college, colleges spring up only to quickly go into administration, leaving significant numbers of students out of pocket, without qualifications and often with large debts. Therefore, it is my belief that we must do more to protect the vulnerable members of our community who use these services. It is also important that we uphold the integrity of the vet fee help loan regime to ensure that taxpayer funds are used for proper purposes and to achieve the best possible outcomes for students. I believe that TAFE and the not-for-profit sector have distinguished themselves in delivering services to our community. One such not-for-profit is the Meadow Heights Education Centre in my electorate of Cornwall, a not-for-profit community neighbourhood house and registered training organisation. It does not offer vet fee help loans but seeks to provide affordable training in a variety of courses to members of the local community. It also has offered a range of free services such as pro bono lessons for adults. In pursuing Keystone College and other for-profit RTOs, it was never my intention to suggest that the not-for-profit community sector were engaging in similar practices by charging exorbitant fees or engaging in ruthless and unethical practices. The work that Meadow Heights Education Centre does in providing a wide range of skill development, life skills, job readiness and social support is quite clearly different to the model of a for-profit college that offers a limited uh, and uh, narrowly defined certificate courses at a cost of thousands of dollars. In speaking today, I wish to clarify the distinction 
between the recently closed RTOs who were making a mockery of the vocational education system as it currently operates and the community-based providers, not-for-profit, such as the Meadow Heights Education Centre. And indeed, I will be writing to Mr Charles Cilia, the director of the Meadow Heights Education Centre, clarifying this point. My efforts to seek fair and quality services for my constituents were in no way directed at the not-for-profit sector. And I look forward to these organisations, including the Meadow Heights Education Centre, joining me in a campaign against abuses and fighting for a properly regulated and well-resourced training and vocational education system, which also includes, includes a strong TAFE sector. I thank the member for call and call the member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. This week's announcement of 12 submarines being built in Adelaide is a great result, not just for the state, but also our country. And let me explain why. As a South Australian Member of Parliament, I'm naturally very pleased to have secured the project in Adelaide. But I disagree with some of those comments from those around Australia that the government's decision to build submarines in Adelaide was based more on politics than on national security and the needs of our Royal Australian Navy. Believe it or not, Adelaide is strategically and geographically important for our national security, and I understand the experts at the Department of Defence who provided advice to this government know this as well. A series of federal government decisions over the last few decades has helped create a long-term defence hub in Adelaide. We have the established infrastructure from the Collins Class Program and the Air Warfare Destroy Program. South Australia also has a community of defence companies supporting these programs. This is recognised internationally too. During her visit to Adelaide in 2012, United States presidential hopeful and then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton said, Adelaide is, from our perspective, one of the great critical industrial centres in the world and part of Australia's defence manufacturing and a city where American and Australian companies work together in close partnership every day. Given we have this hub of defence industries at Techport, it makes sense for Australia to build the existing infrastructure um, for the future submarines to, to use it. And this is acknowledged by international defence companies too. Leading defence companies have said to me that Adelaide has the best defence shipbuilding infrastructure. End of point. Often criticised point about Adelaide is its location, to argue too far away from our submarines for servicing. Few people think about the strategic benefit of Adelaide's isolation. Having little naval activity off the coast means our submarines are easier to protect when they are going in and out of service, which happens quite regularly. Being able to slip underwater in a quiet and unobserved location is a huge tactical advantage few people think about. Now, also in terms of the national benefit, I want to just touch on the suppliers around Australia. Although most of the work will be done in Adelaide in terms of the build, and many suppliers are in Adelaide and South Australia, and DCNS has confirmed that 90 per cent of the build is likely to occur in Australia. So this is great news, um, and great news for the supply chain around Australia. And I just want to touch on the supply chain. I know the member for Canning has just left from WA, and I've got the member for Banks here. And, and that, those two states are huge beneficiaries. And let me go through some, some companies. Um, actually, I won't go through many companies because there are so many, but I will say that there are um, a good significant number of countries of companies, both on the submarines but also the Air Warfare Destroyer program. There's 15 in New South Wales, eight in Victoria, and I know Tasmania builds the accommodation units, and I'm sure Queensland has a few quality suppliers. So finally, there's also the multiplier effect, 2.3 billion per annum of suppliers around Australia. 70 per cent of Australian-made goods go into these, these projects and also other service industries. A great project, a nation-building project for Australia. The member for Hindmarsh. And I call the member for Indi. Deputy Speaker, it gives me great pleasure to be here today on our last day of term, as it feels, and to bring this really important matter to the attention of the House. I'd like to present to the House two petitions uh, that have been approved by the committee, and I would like to present them to the House. The petitions read, the residents and landowners of the Thauqua and Nariel Valleys in the Shire of Tawong, in the federal seat of Indi in Victoria, draw to the attention of the House to the need for more mobile phone coverage in both the valleys detailed above. These valleys are virtually side by side geographically and neither presently has mobile coverage. They are both in a high danger bushfire area. A bushfire can easily cut power and landline telephone services to the areas designated, removing the ability of any of the residents or visitors to monitor their personal safety or the level of danger to other people and property. The petitioners therefore ask the House 
to instruct the Federal Minister for Communications of the and the Department of Communications and Arts to ensure that the Telstra Corporation installs a facility for mobile telephone coverage in both the Thaukwa and Nariel Valleys without delay. In addition, the petitioners respectfully request that the House advise them through the principal petitioner when the requested services will be provided. Uh, the pr principal petitioner, and it gives me great pleasure to say Mrs Sue Sullivan. Uh, I would now like to talk to this petition and why it is so important. The community of Nariel Creek and Thalqua Valley are in the more isolated areas of North East Victoria. They are up near Corriong, and if you travel south from Corriong heading towards Benambra in Gippsland, you travel through the Nariel Valley to reach them. So they're right up in the hill country of rural and regional Australia. And there are many, many people who live there. There are many people who visit there for, uh, to visit family and friends and then participate in the outdoor sports that is very, um, a growing uh, characteristic of this region. And we have no mobile phone coverage. And we regularly have bushfires that sweep through this hill country. Uh, in 2003, massive fires came through there. Many, many areas were burned. The need for mobile phone coverage was then noted, but nothing has happened. And then when I went to look at the uh, budget, the Treasurer said this is a plan for Australia, but it wasn't a plan for rural and regional Australia. There was no plan for mobile phone coverage, no round three, no round four. So I call on the government to seriously commit to making sure that wherever you are in rural and regional Australia, you can use your mobile phones. It's not only the people up in these isolated valleys. It's the people in Beechworth, it's the people in Yakandanda, it's the people in Wurundji who can't even use their phones. We need a national plan, but it needs to include mobile phone coverage so that wherever you are in this wonderful country, you can do what the people in the city can do, which is use your mobile phone. I thank the member for Indi and call the member for Banks. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. And I'm pleased to have the opportunity uh, today to uh, acknowledge uh, the great efforts of the uh, Penshurst RSL uh, Swim Club. Now, on the 2nd of April, I attended the uh, Penshurst uh, RSL Youth Swim Club's uh, annual presentation evening at the uh, Peakhurst West Public School pool, uh, which is a, a very uh, uh, highly used uh, uh, pool in my uh, electorate. Um, and I presented the uh, bank's uh, Outstanding Sporting Achievement Awards on the evening. Now, the club is run uh, entirely uh, by volunteers, uh, President uh, Ray Roy and a whole host of other uh, volunteers who keep things ticking over uh, every year. Um, and importantly, the uh, club not only provides for, uh, for swimming and the various uh, races and so on, but also uh, learn to swim classes for the uh, smaller kids, uh, which is of course so important, particularly uh, in, our, in our nation. So uh, I want to thank uh, Penshurst RSL uh, Swim Club for all of the opportunities uh, they provide for uh, local kids. Uh, and, uh, and look forward to uh, continuing to work uh, with the club. Now, Deputy Speaker, the uh, Resourceful Australian Indian uh, Network uh, is an important group uh, located in my electorate at uh, Penshurst. Uh, RAIN provides a, a range of uh, support uh, services for people in the uh, Australian uh, Indian uh, community in, in my electorate. Um, and I was pleased that recently uh, RAIN uh, was uh, awarded a grant of $9,000 under the federal government's uh, Stronger Communities Program uh, for audio-visual uh, equipment in its uh, centre in Penshurst. Um, this will uh, enable RAIN to uh, better uh, run uh, various uh, seminars and uh, uh, other information sessions that it uh, runs at its uh, uh, Penshurst uh, location. Uh, RAIN provides cultural activities, uh, recreational events, uh, information se sessions, uh, health and fitness programs and a range of other really important programs in the Indian community. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Sudha uh, Natarajan, the CEO, and all of the other members of the executive committee. Deputy Speaker, at, uh, St. at Carlton uh, in my electorate, uh, St Cuthbert's uh, Anglican Church uh, is a real centre uh, in the community. Um, and the uh, church provides not only uh, the, uh, the traditional church services, but also a range of broader services for the community uh, as well. Uh, things such as information on uh, parenting uh, skills, uh, internet safety, and a range of other uh, uh, issues as well uh, that are uh, run by the uh, St Cuthbert's uh, community. Um, I'd like to uh, thank uh, uh, Minister Steve uh, Wakeford for his uh, leadership, um, and also to uh, Lyndon uh, Mitchell for the large amount of work that he puts in. 
uh, for the uh, St Cuthbert's community and indeed the broader uh, Carlton community, which benefits uh, from the uh, efforts of St Cuthbert's. I thank the member for Banks and call the member for Chifley. Deputy Speaker, I want to dedicate my uh, constituency statement actually to another electorate. I visited the member for Batman's electorate the other day. I was going to make a contribution talking about how good looking, svelte, and fun he is, but since the standing orders since the standing orders stopped me from misleading the House, they've sucked the fun out of this place. But uh, I did enjoy spending some time with Mr Feeney uh, in his electorate. And what was uh, especially fun about it was uh, we got to visit the Melbourne Innovation Centre. Uh, it's uh, located in Alphington and it's one of their three locations in Victoria. And they've got some impressive staff there, including CEO David Williamson, who uh, took us on the tour of the centre and it involved seeing a number of small businesses that have made a great start with a bit of help. Uh, one business we saw was Gourmet Lovers, started by Theo uh, Arapoglu. Did I say that right? Arapoglu, yes. Melbourne businessman. Uh, he's uh, running uh, Gourmet Lovers, which produces premium Australian olives and extra virgin olive oil and even secured a $1.5 million deal with Costco, which is huge. Uh, and they cover the US, Canada and UK with those sales and they started exporting to Europe in 2005, later Taiwan, South Korea, Japan, all accessing better sales margins through the process. And Theo found that the grocery market here in Australia had a lot of pressure on margins as supermarkets went into battle with each other and the retail market became quite different. So gourmet lovers exporting their products have, become a, uh, have found a way to become more sustainable and profitable. Uh, we also got to meet Eva from La Serene Brewery. La Serene is an artisanal brewing company. You learn something new every day. Artisanal uh, that produce small batches of unfiltered and unpasteurised beer, which uses, uses natural processes for their re-fermentation and extended maturation uh, in the bottle. And another entrepreneur we met was uh, Raoul Luesha, who's um, uh, the director of Luesha Technic, producing carbon fibre bikes. Uh, and has been employed previously by Boeing Aerospace uh, and the Australian Institute of Sports before starting his own centre, uh, doing terrific work there. Uh, this centre is creating new innovative enterprises, creating the jobs of the future in business for 18 years and become self-sufficient during the duration. These are exactly the type of suburban-based centres that require more support. They will uh, help people uh, find a way to get ideas off the ground and create new jobs. Uh, and it is important from my perspective that innovation is not something done just in the inner cities of our capitals, but that suburbs and regions have a role to play. And under Labor's Regional uh, Innovation Fund, we look to promote just that, uh, $16 million to promote these type of centres to get the ideas and the jobs of the future. I thank the member for Chifley and call the member for Ford. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I'd like to take this opportunity to speak about some of the wonderful community organisations in the electorate of Ford that have benefited from the Coalition Government's Stronger Communities program. Firstly, I'd like to speak about Trin Rivers Community Care at Eagleby, who has received $10,450 through Round 1 of the Stronger Communities Fund to put towards air conditioning their food co-op. The Food Co-op offers fresh food and other essential grocery items at very low cost, which provides a tremendous service to people in our community who are on a tight budget. Their motto is that their service is about treating people with dignity, the dignity and respect they deserve and offering a hand up rather than a hand out. People who grocery shop in supermarkets do so under the comfort of an air-conditioned centre, so why not the people who work and shop at Twin Rivers Food Co-op. Their centre can, be, can get quite hot during summer and this federal funding will help the Twin Rivers Community Care offer the comfort and support to Eagleby and the surrounding communities. Next, M Madam Deputy Speaker, is Carabee Lighthouse Care at Logan Home, another great local organisation to benefit from the Stronger Communities Grant Program. Ron and Debbie Hill are two amazing and hard-working people in our community who also offer low-cost groceries, including their popular $25 shopping trolleys. The next project is the Lighthouse Care Kitchen Project, which has been given a boost with a $10,000 grant under Stronger Communities. It was a pleasure to announce Lighthouse Care as a recipient of this grant 
as they are such a deserving organisation. They are currently working on a great project to open a cafe at their Logan home site where they will provide support and assistance to those in need. It is a terrific initiative and I look forward to our contribution giving them the boost to complete the project. Providing funds over a number of years under stronger communities across all electorates across Australia is a tremendous way that this government has sought to support those smaller organisations and groups in our community that do so much tremendous work that very often doesn't get the publicity and recognition that bigger organisations do. It is through the work of these many small organisations across our, our community, across the country, that allow people who are in need or need that hand up rather than that hand out can go to these organisations and find support and that help. So I commend the work that the Stronger Communities Fund is doing across the country to support these great organisations. I thank the member for Ford and call the member for Kennedy. Um, I thought uh, there was a magnificent uh, article in the quarterly essays by George uh, Megalogenis. And uh, uh, in the article he said, uh, the country is in an almost impossible position because the Liberals will not borrow money, which means, of course, they can't do anything. I mean, what they spend this year is what they spent last year. So if you want to develop uh, a dam or a gully basin or whatever, then uh, you have to borrow. And a magnificent example of that in the budget was the decision not to give loans for water development, but to allow the states to borrow the money, which uh, was uh, very, very cutting indeed, because uh, it is thought that uh, Minister Joyce can run around building dams, but in actual fact, the federal government will have no debt burden. So it is impossible for the Liberal Party because of their ideology and their lapdogs, the National Party, and I say that with some malice, uh, um, 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 to, to do anything. Now, on the Labor side, he makes the point that, yes, they borrow money. They have no hesitation to borrow money. Um, they put pink bats in your roof. They do uh, <laughs> improvements to school buildings, magnificent stuff for the future of Australia, things that we really need. <coughs> They've already announced 4,000 million, no problem at all to borrow 4,000 million, put a rail bridge across the Brisbane River. Uh, most of my children were under. Uh, oh, another tunnel. Good. Oh, I'm pleased you're amazed at that because Brisbane is the most tunneled city in the world per head of population by a long way. To put it in context, Queensland has 21 kilometres of tunnels and Sydney, with five times its population, has 14 kilometres of of tunnels. And if you compare it with London or New York or Tokyo or anywhere, it's the most tunnel city in the world. Now, the Courier Mail, um, um, there is a sticker that says, uh, is it true or is it in the Courier Mail? <laughs> but on this occasion, the Courier Mail said, this tunnel will allow people to get home 15 minutes, 15 minutes extra. Uh, they will get at home. Isn't that wonderful? Well, fair words, not mine. A few thousand people will get home 15 minutes early. That's what you get for the tunnel. A few thousand people getting home 15 minutes early. Uh, thank the member for Kennedy, and I call the member for Petrie. Well, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Look, I just rise as, uh, to, to speak as the 44th Parliament comes to a close. To give a bit of a personal recap, I want to say to the people of my electorate, I've really enjoyed being the federal member the last two and a half years since I was sworn in. Uh, growing up in Bracken Ridge, uh, which takes, is part of one of the suburbs in my seat of Petrie, it's been a real honour to be able to 
represent people in Brackenridge and right throughout the federal seat of Petrie. So I want to put on record that I've really enjoyed that. I particularly enjoyed bringing the current Prime Minister and the former Treasurer, Joe Hockey, to politics in the pub that I had at the Brackenridge Tavern and getting those Cabinet Ministers to mix with the people. It's been a real honour. And as I said in my maiden speech, one of the things that I enjoyed most of all was is that life is about relationships, about relationships with other people. And I've had the great honour of talking to many people over the last two and a half years uh, and getting to know them personally, and that's been fantastic. In relation to wins for the electorate, there's been a lot of wins in the electorate. Now, at the last election, there was three big areas of concern for people. It was around jobs, infrastructure, and stopping uh, people smuggling boats that um, were coming in terribly under the last government. Of course, jobs has been a big issue, and I've managed to have job seeker boot camps. I did one just a couple of weeks ago where we had about 50 unemployed people, and from that, seven people have jobs. Infrastructure has been rolled out with the Dolphin Stadium, four million for that, the Moreton Bay Rail Link, some 450 million, the Bruce Highway upgrades, the Gateway Motorway North upgrade that's happening at the moment, um, as well as NBN sooner into North Lakes, Brackenridge and other areas, which has been really good. The environment's been a big winner with the Green Army projects. I've got two currently underway and two completed. The community grants to people like Redcliffe Coast Guard, the Deception Bay PCYC, the Redcliffe PCYC has been good. We've been able to raise awareness about domestic violence. Solar uptake, solar panels in my electorate have gone through the roof as we've promoted local solar. Uh, childcare has also been good. We've got a lot more childcare changes we want to make if only Labor would put through the changes in relation to the uh, family tax benefits, which they're blocking, and the childcare changes aren't come through. Boundary Road and the Rothwell up roundabout upgrade. But there's a lot more to do in relation to tourism, boosting the Bruce, the Bald Hills Memorial Hall, more Green Army and more work for jobs. And I say to people in my electorate, this budget is about jobs and growth. It's about transitioning from the mining construction boom to the future economy. Don't elect Labor at this upcoming election where they have $100 billion in more taxes and more spending, as we just heard from the member for Kennedy. That's all they want to do. We want to get the nation on, on track, jobs, growth and ensuring that the future of Australia is in safe hands with the coalition. I'll be fighting hard. Thank you. I thank the member for Petrie. In accordance with Standing Order 193, the time for members' constituency statements has concluded. I call the clerk. Oh, sorry, I call the member for Petrie. Uh, okay. Yep. Sure. Well, I seek leave to move that order of the day number one, committee and delegation business, be postponed to a later hour. Is leave granted? I call the member for Petrie. Yeah, I move that order of the day number one, committee and delegation business, be postponed to a later hour. The motion is moved by the uh, honourable member for Petrie. All those in favour, aye. Those against, nay. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Committee and delegation business, order of the day number two, standing committee on social policy and legal affairs report. The question is that the document be noted and I call the member for Morton. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Nobody would deny the heartache felt by somebody who has been dealt the terrible misfortune of being unable to become a parent when they want to. The urge to be a parent can be overwhelming, compelling, all consuming, as I'm sure the, the member next to me would attest to. Uh, sadly, sadly, one in six women do miss out sometimes on having a child, many when they uh, want to have that child. Nowadays, advances in medical technology have given people options not available even a decade ago. Even so, there are still Australians who cannot attain parenthood through assisted reproductive technology without the assistance of another woman willing to carry the child during gestation and give birth. This is commonly called surrogacy. And I was in part of the Social Policy and Legal Affairs Committee uh, that conducted an inquiry into the regulatory and legislative aspects of international and domestic surrogacy. There are many happy stories of people uh, experiencing surrogacy. They've achieved their dream of parenting through engaging a surrogate. The vast majority of people who undertake the surrogacy journey become wonderful parents with healthy children who have happy, healthy babies and 
they're devoted to those children. Sadly, it has been reported that some commercial surrogacy arrangements have not protected the rights of those involved, including the child. And in others, the commissioning parents have not entered into these arrangements with pure motives. Australian laws struggle to keep pace with advancements being made in assisted reproductive technology. More than 800 children born through surrogacy arrangements have been brought to Australia through citizenship by descent applications in the past five years, meaning there's the child has the genetic material of a, an Australian. And this wave is cresting and maybe could get even bigger yet. There are two types of surrogacy arrangements recognised in Australian laws. Altruistic surrogacy, where the surrogate is only remunerated for reasonable expenses, and commercial surrogacy, where the surrogate is paid a fee for her services. Commercial surrogacy is illegal in all states and territories. In the Australian Capital Territory, New South Wales and Queensland, it is also illegal to enter into a commercial surrogacy arrangements outside those jurisdictions. In those states and territories, residents would commit a crim criminal offence if they entered into a commercial arrangement with a surrogate from overseas. Notwithstanding these existing laws, more and more people are entering into overseas surrogacy arrangements. For children born by altruistic surrogacy in Australia, fitting within the state and territory legislative schemes, the Family Law Act 1975 deems those children to be the children of the commissioning parents. Where commissioning parents have entered into commercial surrogacy arrangements overseas, notwithstanding the illegality, there are no laws available for them to be legally recognised as the parents of the surrogate child. The only avenue currently open to them is to apply to the fa family court for a parenting order. However, a parenting order does not recognise that the child is legally a child of those commissioning parents applying for the order. The parenting order would merely convey parental responsibility for the child onto the commissioning parents. The family court is in a bind when presented with applications by such commissioning parents for parenting orders. In such cases, the commissioning parents may have committed an illegal act. The child has been brought to Australia from his or her country of birth. The commissioning parents will be looking after the child but not recognised as the child's parents. The birth mother is overseas and not completely, if at all, involved in the application in front of the Australian Family Court. Such situations are problematic. Family Court judges have been complaining about the state of the laws and the difficulties they face when determining such applications. Before commissioning parents can apply to the Family Court, they must bring the child to Australia. To do so, they can apply to the Australian Embassy in the country of birth for citizenship by descent for the child if at least one person who was the parent at the time of the birth is an Australian citizen. This does not confer any parental status on the commissioning parents. There are numerous cases where birth documents have been falsified or don't exist at all. While the current state of the laws and the obstacles <coughs> that need to be overcome in order to obtain a child are a problem for the commissioning parents, there are other lives affected by these arrangements that also need further consideration. Surrogate mothers are usually the hidden face of such arrangements. While she has the most important role for the child, the commissioning parents very often do not wish to create a relationship with her, nor do they often consider her position or plight in the arrangement they have entered into. The first question is whether the surrogate freely consented to the arrangement. A seemingly simple question that must consider the age and understanding of the surrogate and her overall capacity to enter into the arrangement. An economic imbalance may result in a poor surrogate mother being practically coerced. Moreover, they are also at risk of fraud visited on them by the procuring middlemen. A surrogate mother may be left literally holding the baby during a contractual arrangement. However, poor surrogates would hardly be bargaining as equals. She would most typically not be literate or have any education. It is reported that surrogates have not been told what procedures are being done to them or how many embryos are being implanted. It is common practice to perform caesarean sections on surrogates so that the commissioning parents can obtain flights at the correct time to be there for the birth. And there appears to be little concern about the lasting health effects on surrogate mothers once the baby has been handed over. Once the baby is born, the surrogate's mother's job is done. There appears to be no concern for the emotional upheaval of handing the baby to the commissioning parents. Sadly, in most cases, the surrogate mother will never see the child again. In Australia, we would never allow our citizens to be treated in the way surrogates are treated overseas in some countries. Our laws protect the most vulnerable from such abuse and contractual imbalances. While the commissioning parents have made a decision to enter into the surrogacy arrangement and the surrogate mother may have had limited choice, the child born has had no choice in the arrangement at all. 
Three commonly used types of surrogacy are in use. Total gestational, where the embryo is created from the egg and sperm of the commissioning parents. Uh, parents. Gestational, where one of either the egg or sperm is donated but the other is from the commissioning parents. Or gestational, with the use of a donor embryo. In each of these types of surrogacy, the surrogate mother has no biological con connection with the child unless her egg has been donated. Where the child is born overseas, that child is subject to the laws of that country until removed to Australia. In some countries, the birth mother is recognised as being the parent of the child, regardless of his or her biological makeup. Where a donor embryo is used, the child is not entitled to Australian citizenship by descent. The birth certificate issued in the foreign country may not always be accurate and does not necessarily help in any application for Australian citizenship. Consequently, the child may be left stateless. Once in Australia, if the child is able to obtain citizenship by descent, the child will consequently have no official parents recognised by Australian law. Deputy Speaker, at best, the child may have parents who have parental responsibility until the child is 18 years old. The other less spoken of but no less important aspect of the child born of surrogacy is the potential for long-term psychological issues. Such children may never know the identity of their biological mother or father or the person who gave birth to them. This lack of identifying information may impact on the child's self-perception, but also their relationship with commissioning parents and others. It could be argued that the Convention on the Rights of the Child supports the right of all children, including children born through surrogacy, to know their biological identity. Along with knowing their own personal identity, the biological history of a child can be important to identify any health concerns that may be woven into their biological history, into their DNA. There has been increasing awareness and debate about surrogacy by the general population due to the baby gammy case and other reported cases, and there has been an increasingly vocal call from judges to do something about this issue and to do it soon. Chief Judge Pascoe of the Federal Circuit Court has been particularly vocal about this issue. He made a submission to the inquiry and appeared to give evidence. The Chief Judge has consistently stated that Australia should adopt a uniform approach in all jurisdictions and move towards a model of domestic domestic commercial surrogacy regulation open only to Australian citizens. He suggests a short list of countries also to be approved for international commercial surrogacy. These countries would meet a minimum standard of protections and human rights conventions and will share with Australia details of the applicants. If a commissioning parent enters into a surrogacy arrangement with a surrogate not in a shortlisted country, then that will be unlawful and the government should enforce the law to prevent the child ever entering Australia. Whilst this would be harsh, the message would quickly filter out to commissioning parents. This is a very, very difficult area that sparks very emotive responses from stakeholders. Hearing the evidence was particularly troubling, Deputy, Deputy Speaker, because of the heartache involved from, from both the children, the parents, uh, and uh, all, all involved. The committee's recommendations from the Social Policy and Legal Affairs Committee may not go as far as some would like, but they are a start. The recommendation that the Attorney General requ request the Australian Law Reform Commission to conduct a 12-month inquiry into the surrogacy laws of Austra the Australian states and territories with a view to developing a model national law on altruistic surrogacy would be a huge step for those wishing to enter into altruistic surrogacy arrangements in Australia. I know this is an emotive issue, but I do not think that our laws have caught up with our technology, and I'd urge the government uh, of the 45th parliament, whoever that might be, to consider this more closely. I thank the member for Morton. The question is, do you wish to speak on this? Sorry. I call the member for Petrie. Thank you. Yeah, I move that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the debate be made on order to the day of the next meeting. Sorry. No, no. It's, don't worry. You're speaking on the next one, not this one. You're not speaking on surrogacy, are you? No. No, no, I know that. Yep, it's okay. You got that? I call the member for, let, let's try this again. I call the member for Petrie. Thank you. Uh, I move that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the debate be made in order of the day for the next meeting. The question is that the debate be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. Those against say nay. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. Committee and delegation business order of the day and number three, standing committee on agriculture and industry report on smart farming. The question is that the document be noted, and I call the member for McGowan. Oh, sorry, I call the member for Indi. Thank, Thank you, Deputy Speaker. It gives me enormous pleasure to speak to the report, Smart Farming, 
Inquiry into, As into Agricultural Innovation, presented by the House of Representatives Standing Committee of Agriculture and Industry. Our terms of reference for this report were to, were to conduct an inquiry, in particular to have regard to improvements in the efficiency of agricultural practices due to new technology, uh, emerging technology relevant to the agricultural sector in areas including but not limited to telecommunications, and to report on barriers to adoption of emerging technology. This has been an excellent committee to be part of, and I'm very proud that we have bipartisan recommendations that fundamentally set in place foundations for the future of policy in agriculture innovation for the 21st century and, I hope, for the 22nd century. We've particularly looked at innovation and productivity being the key to growth in Australian agriculture. And in INDI, productivity and growth are key to our ability to increase agricultural production, agricultural manufacturing, agricultural profitability, and in the long term, sustainability for the many people who live and work in our communities and our valleys. I'm very proud to be part of this committee and this inquiry in particular, as it brings together my interest, indeed my passion, for agriculture, research, extension, adoption, and the ability to increase the economic viability of our farming communities, and as a consequence, the economic viability and sustainability of our nation. And as a farmer, since 1980, I know how important research is, and I've always been an active learner and participator in many of the extension groups, and particularly how much I've enjoyed our, Wir our Wiradjuri women and sheep group, learning about DSEs, introduction to soil tests and in analysis, as well as being able to be part of a group learning activity in a community where we actually saw product productivity increase in our community. I love extension. I love the impact it has to improve people's lives, to improve their farming ability and to bring a community together. together. And as a businesswoman, I've worked with most of the rural development corporations over 20 years, and I've had extensive insight into how our research gets funded, how it's translated to farmers, and I have enormous respect both for the scientists, the researchers, the extension officers, and the people who work on those RDCs. And in my community work, I've worked as a volunteer with Australian Women in Agriculture, eventually rising to become um, the president of the organisation and to be awarded the great honour as a life member. So I've participated both in the organisational structure of the NGO and moving right through to being a representative on many government boards in that position. And as a woman in agriculture, as a farmer, I'm totally conscious of the importance of language and how our language defines our paradigms and how I take enormous exception to when people refer to the farmer, he. There's very, very few of our Australian farmers that are actually the or he. Most of our farms are run by family businesses and they contain men and women and young people. I am particularly conscious of how this language defines our research and development. And over the period of time, my research search has shown that we have got a bias towards working with male farmers as opposed to the women farmers and the young people who are active partners of our farming business. So I've spent 20 years working with the Agricultural Research and Development Corporation, in particular to bring, to bring women into that mainstream of accessing the knowledge and the innovation so that they can be part of the taking those innovations up on their farms. Uh, so just to put that little bit of attention there to the language, to the importance of talking about farming businesses and not just name individuals on the farm, to be inclusive of men and women and young people and older people when we try and take our, ex our innovations onto um, the farms. And the second large area where my voluntary work has given me great insight is being a regional councillor for the Victorian Farmers' Federation over a number of years and through that participating in the NFF and seeing how those national NGOs can have such an impact on our ability to deliver really sustainable growth on our farms. We're partners together. And the final bit of background that really adds to my love of being on this committee was being an active member of the, a plan, the, the group of people that brought together the National Strategic Plan for Rural R&D in Australia, that looked at the grand picture of Australian rural research and development, and we came up with a national investment plan 
of what we needed to do to actually take the, to make the step ups and take us through to the next the next stage of our development. So with that background, it gave it, it fitted logically to me being on this committee and to being an active participant in the committee. And today I'm really pleased to talk about some of the 17 recommendations that were made. And in particular, I'd like to concentrate on three areas where we made recommendations. I'd like to talk about the recommendation regarding women. I'd like to talk about the recommendation about funding of CRCs and uh, rural, re rural research and development corporations. And I'd like to finish by addressing my remarks about the black spot, mobile phone black spot program. So about women. There's a wonderful recommendation in this report that I'm really proud to, to acknowledge and work towards. Recommendation six. The committee recommends that the Australian government ensure that rural women's groups are included in future government-led policy building activities and inquiries. In 1996, RURDEC, rural, research, rural Industries Research and Development Corporation, undertook a major project looking at the contribution Australian women in agriculture make to, make to agriculture. The report missed opportunities, had the figure of $14 billion, and that was 20 years ago, of women's contribution to agriculture. So it's vitally important that if we are going to do the innovations we need, make the step-ups that we need to really take Australian agriculture to the next level, we need to involve our women and we need to involve our young people. Um, I rest my case there. It's obvious. It just needs to be done. The second recommendation I'd like to pay some attention to is recommendation nine. The committee recommends that the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources, in conjunction with the Department of Industry, Innovation and Science, investigate establishing appropriate incentives for the greater allocation of resources from rural research and development corporations to relevant cooperative research centres. So we had a major discussion in our committee about the role of RDCs and the role of CRCs, cooperative research centres, and how the CRCs can really take us into the next stage of our development. And there was one particular area that I'd like to bring to the attention of the parliament. It was the need for working together for cooperation around our soils. Our soils underpin all of our agriculture. They're probably the most important resource we've got, but yet we've got no um, RDC that looks at soils as a whole. We've certainly got no CRC that looks at soil. And we heard that the problem is that soil is so all-encompassing, it's really hard to get everybody to work together. So my huge call to the, the, the people involved in rural research and development is can we please pay attention to our soils? Can we bring wool and meat and dairy and horticulture and grains and sugar and the rest together and provide a cooperative looking at how we take our soils and our knowledge of soils to the future, not just for the carbon, not just for the um, micro, micro life that exists there, but if we could grow our soils, we could really grow our agricultural productivity. So I put out a call there for a CRC on soils and really hope that in the next period of parliament we can bring our work together on that and work together. And finally, I'd like to talk about recommendation two in the report. The committee recommends that the Australian government commit to the continuation of the mobile phone black spot program beyond the second round, and that the Department of Communication and the Arts consider changes and additions to the selection criteria to capture the telecommunications requirement of agricultural activity. And here I am scathing of the government. I am scathing of the budget that came down on Tuesday night. The Treasurer, Scott Morrison, gets up there and says he's got a plan for Australia. Well, he might have a plan for Sydney and Melbourne. He might have a plan for Brisbane and South Australia. He might have a plan for defence, but he certainly didn't bring down a plan for regional Australia. And the absolute effrontery of not having any money in that budget for the continuation of delivering mobile phone coverage to rural and regional Australia is something to be absolutely ashamed of. So, Scott Morrison, I call on you to do something about this. And to the Prime Minister. Prime Minister, you were in charge of communications. You understand how important mobile phone coverage is. It's not an add-on. It's not an additional extra. We need mobile phone coverage in rural Australia, and we need it for agriculture. So I call on my government colleagues here. I call on all of you people who live in rural and regional Australia. Pay attention to what needs to be done. We need round three, four, five and six until wherever you are in rural and regional Australia, you can use your mobile phone to do the business of this country that so absolutely urgent, is so absolutely urgently needed. 
I thank the member for Indi and I call the member for Petrie. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I move that the debate be adjourned and the resumption of the debate, debate be made in order of the day for the next meeting. The question is that debate be adjourned. All those in favour say aye, those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the member for Petrie. I move that the Federation and Chamber do now adjourn. The question is, oh sorry, uh, is there a second for this motion? I thank the member for Corwell. The question is that the motion be agreed to and I call the member for Kingston. Madam Deputy Speaker, well, we are on the eve of an election and uh, there will be a lot of issues that will be discussed during that election period. And I've put on record in this place many times about the stark difference between uh, Labor and the Coalition when it comes to education. But today I want to put on record the stark difference when it comes to health care. In my first speech in this place, I talked about the importance of money not determining uh, what level of health care you get in this country. And it seems that, uh, that what I spoke about nine years ago uh, will be a debate in this election because it seems that the government uh, is slowly walking away from the concept of universal health care. And it was on stark display uh, in the budget where uh, the government now is planning to freeze Medicare rebates, which is really a, a GP tax by stealth, uh, which will, um, reports today, suggest a $14 out-of-pocket expense for those that are currently bulk built and th those that are already paying a gap, one would assume that that $14 will be put on top of the payment out-of-cost expenses already incurred. So we're starting to see uh, very much where the out-of-pocket expenses are going to be more than the Medicare rebate, um, which suggests that there is no concept, no, no real concept of universal health anymore in this country. Of course, we also had earlier this year, uh, or sorry, late last year, my EFO. My EFO that also had savage cuts to Medicare in it particularly removing the bulk billing incentive to pathology and diagnostic tests. And uh, that, uh, I think, is incredibly short-sighted because, of course, diagnostic and uh, uh, screening tests are all about prevention. Uh, and to make those tests more expensive would mean that uh, people could delay actually getting these really, really important diagnostic tests. And of course, if you delay those tests, in the case, for example, of ovarian cancer, it could have deadly consequences. Deadly consequences, not to mention, of course, the increased uh, cost to our medical system uh, when uh, those, uh, might those uh, individuals might have to go through extensive invasive surgery, uh, more longer term uh, uh, cancer management uh, treatment as well. So very short-sighted. But today I want to touch on, in particular, the impact that uh, re removing the bulk billing incentive payments has on women's health, because uh, that has been raised a number of times with me. Of course, what we've seen with the uh, removing the bulk billing incentive for diagnostic tests would mean that mammograms are going to be more expensive, ultrasounds are going to be more expensive, pap smears are going to be more expensive. All of these have an impact on uh, the availability of services, particularly for women. And uh, we, as I said, uh, these will lead to higher, either higher out-of-pocket uh, costs or, more importantly, women putting these tests off. And that will, as I said, have deadly consequences. And, of course, uh, what we've seen um, is indeed uh, a cost burden that will affect women in particular. Now, um, I have to say the message has been coming to me loud and clear and the grassroots movement, uh, women's movements in South Australia, have been getting more and more angry about these cuts. And indeed, uh, in particular, one of the groups, the Labor Women's Network, has put up this very excellent poster uh, sending a message to Malcolm Turnbull, women's health 
is not for sale. Uh, and, uh, and very important message, women's health is not for sale, Malcolm Turnbull. And they are running a very strong campaign. And I would like to particularly uh, uh, thank uh, and put on record my thanks to Emily Burke, Tess Farrell uh, and Georgie Barr, who worked on this campaign, who were motivated by these cuts and said, enough is enough. Uh, they're all mothers uh, and uh, activists uh, in, the, the, in this area, and they said, enough is enough. We need to put a spotlight on what these cuts mean for women. So they are running a campaign that's been taken up nationally, uh, and this will be an issue that I will be talking about, as I know all my Labor colleagues will be talking about, is that women's health, and indeed the health of Australians, is not for sale. Malcolm Turnbull and his government needs to bring back universal uh, health care in this country, not walk away from it. The member's time has expired. I thank the member for Kingston. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Banks. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. Well, Deputy Speaker, recently uh, I attended the uh, Oatley Bay uh, Sea Scouts, uh, la uh, located uh, in my uh, electorate. Um, it's a tremendous uh, group uh, and a very active group with uh, dozens of uh, kids involved in, uh, in scouting uh, and cubs and, and uh, other activities. And because, as the name suggests, they are located on the bay, the kids have the good fortune of being involved not just in the traditional scouting activities but also canoeing and kayaking uh, and a range of other uh, water-based activities as well. On the night I attended, the uh, group was uh, practising uh, various emergency scenarios and about what to do and, and how, to, how to help in different emergencies. And it was good to see them both having fun and, uh, and learning a lot at the same time. I'd like to thank uh, Mark uh, Connell, the group leader, uh, John Vickery, the uh, cub leader, and also Jen Attard, uh, the scout leader, uh, for uh, having me along uh, on the evening. Um, it's a, a beautiful location where uh, Oatley Bay uh, Sea Scouts uh, conduct their activities, and it is great to see such a uh, enthusiastic and strong group of uh, kids uh, getting involved in the scouting movement. Deputy Speaker, on Good Friday this year, I attended the uh, Good Friday liturgy at uh, St Chabelle's uh, Church uh, in Punchbowl. Uh, I've attended this service uh, over a number of years uh, in recent times, uh, and, uh, uh, and I do thank the uh, Maronite uh, community for the uh, invitation to attend these important services. Uh, the Good Friday service at uh, St Charbel's in uh, Punchbowl is traditionally attended by uh, thousands uh, of people who uh, practice the uh, Maronite uh, Catholic faith, uh, and uh, I was uh, uh, again very privileged uh, to attend uh, this year. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Father uh, Joseph uh, Sleeman uh, for uh, all of his uh, leadership of the St Charbel's community, uh, and also uh, Bishop Antoine uh, Tarabai, uh, the, uh, the national uh, leader of the uh, Lebanese Maronite Church in Australia, for the uh, many uh, great works they do in the broader uh, Sydney community. Deputy Speaker, uh, in, uh, uh, in, uh, earlier in the year, I attended the opening of the uh, Oatley uh, War Memorial uh, outside Oatley Public School. Now, this uh, memorial uh, had in fact uh, been uh, uh, in place for some decades, but in recent times uh, had fallen into a state of uh, disrepair uh, with uh, various uh, uh, sh shrubbery and so on uh, growing over uh, the uh, memorial. A number of people in the local community uh, decided that uh, that wasn't good enough uh, and what should be done is that that memorial uh, should be uh, reinvigorated uh, and reopened to, uh, to uh, commemorate uh, the uh, sacrifices of, uh, of uh, Oatley residents in war. Uh, the Oatley Heritage and uh, Historical Society did a lot of work on the history uh, of the memorial. Uh, and Oatley Public School uh, played a very important role in uh, putting together all the necessary documentation uh, to, uh, to make the uh, memorial uh, reopening proposal a reality. I'm pleased that uh, the federal government was able to provide a uh, saluting their service grant uh, to assist in this project. Um, and I'd very much like to thank uh, all of the people who were uh, involved. Uh, on the day, the Oatley Public School captains, uh, Anna Sheehan and Jackson Ryan, uh, spoke with uh, great reverence uh, about uh, the uh, sacrifices of soldiers, particularly uh, in World War I. Uh, I'd like to thank them for their contribution. Uh, Principal Debbie Hunter and Ros Ingram 
uh, from uh, Oatley uh, Public School, Bill Wright from the Oatley RSL sub-branch, uh, and Kim Wagstaff and Roger Rob Rob Robertson uh, from the Oatley Heritage and Historical Society. Uh, the reopening of the memorial is a great example of what can be done when uh, communities come together to, uh, to make good things happen. Now, Deputy Speaker, uh, recently uh, I attended the uh, first Padstow Heights uh, Scouts Group, a uh, very uh, active group with a, a long and proud history in the uh, Padstow area. Uh, they're involved in all of the traditional uh, scouting activities, such as uh, bush work, walking uh, and learning survival skills uh, and so on. Um, there are a number of issues about the amenity of the Scout Hall at Padstow Heights and its surrounds, uh, and I'm certainly uh, seeking to assist the uh, scouting uh, movement uh, in addressing those concerns with the uh, local council. Um, I'd like to thank uh, James Salato, uh, the uh, group leader, for inviting me along on the evening, uh, and all of the other parents who, uh, who do so much work to make uh, Padstow Heights uh, Scouts uh, such a successful group uh, in our local community. I thank the member for Banks. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Wakefield. Uh, well, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, I've spoken in this uh, uh, chamber before about uh, uh, the terrible situation of the pinery uh, bushfires, and uh, in 2015, uh, I started the year, and my electorate started the year with bushfires in Sampson Flat, uh, devastating bushfires in, uh, through One Tree Hill and the Adelaide Hills. Uh, and we ended the year uh, very sadly with uh, the fire in Pinery and Malala, uh, which had its epicentre really uh, in uh, places like uh, Wasleys and Hamley Bridge and Owen um, and the Pinkerton Plains. Uh, and when you went out to these uh, communities just after the fire, you saw the intensity of the fire. Uh, it was literally like a moonscape uh, out in these communities. And, uh, the fires had burned so hot uh, that uh, everything was gone, fence posts, uh, fencing, um, every bit of crop. Uh, quite often the, the loam had burnt out of the soil and there was nothing uh, but sand uh, left at the side of the road. So it really was uh, quite the dystopian uh, vision uh, and obviously very devastating uh, losses to stock and, uh, and to farming communities and farming families and tragically to human life uh, and injury. Uh, today I'd seek uh, uh, your leave uh, to present the petition by the community of Wasleys in South Australia uh, regarding uh, poor mobile phone coverage, which they've had to endure uh, prior to, of course, uh, this issue. Um, but, of course, uh, not having mobile phone coverage uh, during that period uh, did present uh, a number of issues. And uh, there are many uh, people who have spoken to me. Mo Shepherd, uh, who uh, is a, a pillar of the community out there, Stella Bliss, who's a principal uh, petitioner uh, in this uh, petition. Uh, they'd spoken to me, you know, obviously about uh, the fact that uh, not having very good mobile phone uh, coverage uh, exacerbated uh, some of the evacuation issues that were experienced on the day. Um, often uh, messages weren't received at all. Um, sometimes they were uh, received late. Uh, and tragically, uh, receiving messages late um, in a non-timely fashion uh, with a fire of this intensity that burnt so quick, uh, had a 50 to 60 kilometre front at one point, um, which changed direction um, and burnt with an intensity that uh, you know, it has not been experienced in living memory uh, in, on the Adelaide Plains and uh, in the mid-north. Certainly uh, did open all of our eyes to um, uh, the interaction, I guess, between uh, mobile phone uh, and internet communications. We obviously rely on it in all of our communities, uh, but of course, and we rely on it to give us timely information. Uh, but uh, in this situation, of course, uh, uh, you know, we learnt that there's some issues with that uh, reliance in, in, on technology. So. Um, present, seek leave to present the petition. Has um, the petition already been? It has been the to the petitions committee. It's not required. Yeah, it's uh, certainly been there and uh, sought their. Uh, <coughs> um, we sought their approval and done it with uh, with their uh, with their uh, order. Um, the member for Wakefield. I ask the member for Wakefield to resume your. It's a division. If I could ask oh. the member for. Are they suspending the 
Shall I continue? Well, uh, notwithstanding, Please continue, Member for Wakefield. <laughs> <laughs> well, notwithstanding the issue uh, of the bells, and they're going off on and off and on and off. But look, uh, in presenting this petition, I'd just say it's a very important issue uh, Order, for my electorate. Order the Member for Wakefield will resume his seat. A division has been called. Division. A division has been called for in the House. The proceedings suspended to enable honourable members to attend the division. The proceedings will resume when the chair of the Federation Chamber is resumed at the conclusion of the division or subsequent division. Whitefield. Uh, well, thank you, Deputy Speaker, and it's a, a great pleasure to uh, return to uh, the subject of the Pinery bushfires, which uh, did uh, devastate my local community and uh, out there on the Adelaide Plains in the mid-north. Uh, many of the people I grew up with um, experienced the loss uh, in this fire. Uh, many of the uh, farm, well, they were farm lads back in the day, but now they're farm owners. Um, out at Freeling and uh, places like that. But I was talking about mobile phone uh, communications on the day were disrupted, uh, messages arrived late. Often those messages were about evacuation points, about where to evacuate to. Obviously, that's a very serious issue. And so one of the things this petition does is call for uh, new towers at Wasley's at Hamley Bridge at Roseworthy uh, to make sure that mobile phone communications uh, in, in this area, which is not that far from Adelaide, uh, um, and deserves uh, modern telecommunications. Uh, this fire certainly highlighted that need, uh, and I have been writing to uh, the Prime Minister and also to uh, the Premier and the State Treasurer about properly funding uh, mobile phone communications out in this region. Uh, obviously, uh, the, uh, uh, in the wake of these terrible fires, we're now five months uh, on from them, uh, the need is still there and the communities look uh, to their governments for uh, a sign that we are listening to them uh, and that we're prepared to commit to local infrastructure which will improve their communities. I thank the member for Wakefield and the question is that the motion be agreed to and call the member for Lyons. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, possibly what's going to be my last contribution uh, in this parliament. I, uh, I make, uh, I'd just like to go back over the last three years and some of the things that I've been able to achieve, uh, not only for my electorate but also the state of Tasmania, uh, uh, that is in a much better state than it was uh, three years ago. Um, we had a situation there when, when we came to government, there was an uh, unemployment had an eight in front of it in, in Tasmania. Today we've still got more work to do, uh, but it's got a six in front of it. Uh, that uh, business confidence uh, was low. Uh, we'd smashed a, a major driver in the Tasmanian economy, uh, thanks to the Labor Green double whammy of, of, of Hobart and Canberra working in tandem to shut down the forest industry in Tasmania. Uh, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've supported that sector. We've enabled to see growth again in that sector, uh, and Tasmania's business confidence now is amongst the highest in the nation. So whether it be in tourism. Uh, whether it be in agriculture, uh, whether it be in aquaculture, whether it be in energy, the announcement that was made uh, last week by Minister Greg Hunt uh, to have Warwick Smith, the former member for Bass, uh, do, a fee uh, do, do a, a feasibility study on the capacity for and the benefits of a second interconnector to be built between uh, Tasmania and Victoria. Uh, this will enable investment to flow into Tasmania and will also provide a greater degree of energy security. Uh, of course, renewable energy is something that Tasmania is a leader in this country, producing 40 per cent of Australia's renewable uh, uh, electricity. Indeed, infrastructure over the last three years, we've had the, the nation's single biggest infrastructure investment, $50 billion around the country, and Tasmania has benefited substantially. Uh, as a result of that commitment, whether it be the rollout of the mobile phone uh, black spots, uh, 19, uh, 19 new towers were committed in the first round in my electorate of Lyons. Uh, they, some of those are about to begin construction, which is great news for those communities that have poor or no uh, 
uh, mobile phone coverage. Uh, the investment in roads, whether it be at a local level through the Black Spots program, whether it be through the uh, Roads to Recovery program, or whether it be more substantial uh, projects such as upgrades of both the Bass Highway and, of course, the 10-year action plan to upgrade Tasmania's major arterial, which is the Midland Highway. Uh, the expansion, of course, and improvement to uh, the rail network in Tasmania that's very important uh, um, in moving freight around and obviously keeping some of that, that, that heavy traffic off Tasmania's roads. The expansion of the Tasmanian Freight Equalisation Scheme indeed was a major initiative uh, for our state and of course this came on the back of the decisions that were made by those uh, opposite in their time in government uh, when, they, when they changed the coastal shipping legislation, Deputy Speaker, that had a terrible impact on our state. Uh, we, we lost our only international shipping service as a result of that, and the costs, therefore, of moving freight uh, to and from Tasmania went up, in some cases, by as much as 60 per cent. And uh, so the Tasmanian Freight Equalisation Scheme expansion to exports was indeed a welcome but not a total fix to the damage that was done under Labor previously. The, invest the investment, Deputy Speaker, in, in irrigation indeed is an enabler for so many communities in my electorate. It's not just about the investment that farmers are making, it's, a, it's about the investment that is occurring in those regional communities that will benefit businesses, will be, benefit uh, employment in those regions, Deputy Speaker, and uh, of course uh, things such as uh, schools, schools make them more sustainable and businesses in local towns. Deputy Speaker, we've embarked on a second phase of that and we're continuing uh, our plan to develop a stronger, more diversified economy, and that was, that was the document, that was the plan that was released on Tuesday night. It's about investing in the national innovation and science agenda to support new start-up business, Deputy Speaker. It's about using and leveraging off the procurement that defence spending has, and indeed in my electorate, one atmosphere in Eagle Hawk Neck, the defence science technology facility up at Scottsdale, are examples of where Tasmania can benefit from that. Of course, the free trade agreements, Deputy Speaker, have been a wonderful thing for Tasmania, and I think Tasmania has captured and imagined uh, the opportunity that exists to our north, perhaps better than some other parts of the country. Uh, Deputy Speaker, of course, the tax cuts indeed are a huge boost to small and medium businesses in our state. In, there's, we have less big businesses in Tasmania, we have more small businesses by proportion, and the tax cuts there, the expansion from businesses with a $2 million turnover to $10 million, a 27.5 per cent tax, a 2.5 per cent tax decrease is significant. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for Lyons. And the question is that the motion be agreed to and call the member for Blair. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. The coalition government's budget has put higher income earners and big business ahead of vulnerable older Australians. Uh, the Prime Minister, when he came to power, usurping the member for Warringah, promised fairness, but this budget is fundamentally unfair to older Australians. The budget gives tax cuts to the big end of town at the cost of $1.2 billion to aged care services for older Australians. This savage cut will hit older Australians in residential aged care facilities the hardest, with a 50 per cent cut to the indexation of complex health care subsidies. Now, the Prime Minister's budget is also telling for what it omits. The budget has failed to provide any direction for the future of aged care reforms. And it really, I really must question whether the Minister has actually read the aged care roadmap that took her months and months to actually discover somewhere in the bowels of her office here in Canberra after it had been delivered to her by the aged care sector committee. The budget has failed once again the 353,000 Australians living with dementia. While the Prime Minister has got plans for the top end of town, He's got no interest in addressing what is the second leading cause of death in the country. There is no funding in the budget whatsoever for any concept such as dementia-friendly communities, which has been adopted overseas as world's best practice. There is no funding whatsoever for an aged care workforce strategy, nor even any mention of an aged care workforce strategy. There is no plans at all in the budget for an age-friendly Australia, even though this is world's best practice adopted by the WHO. 
When this government came to power, Deputy Speaker, one of the first acts they did was to get rid of the aged care workforce supplement, addressing uh, problems in terms of development of an aged care workforce. We're going to need to treble it in the next few decades. Then, after slashing that funding, putting it back in and seeing no appreciable difference in terms of the development of a workforce, they cut the funding for dementia and severe behaviours, a supplement which we provided. Then they cut the aged care payroll tax supplement, which was affecting directly the for-profit providers. They cut 15 per cent out of the budget last time for the development of workforce. Then they rebadged, of course, and put together health and aged care workforce development and cut, in my EFO, $595 million. Then they cut, in my EFO, $472 million for complex needs. Now, in this budget, another $1.2 billion. What has the coalition, what is their attitude to older Australians? if they've inflicted $3.1 billion in cuts in three years for services in residential home care, Commonwealth home support, dementia funding for older Australians. Now, Leading Aged Care Services Australia says this. This is what Leading Aged Care Services Australia spokesperson Beth Cameron said. Said the additional $1.2 billion in cuts to direct care services reveals that Turnbull government and Minister Lee are in denial about the true cost of providing complex care to older Australians. AXA, Age and Community Services Australia, said last night's budget in their press release was lacklustre for aged care with the most significant announcement being a downgrade in funding to counteract higher than expected growth in expenditure. AXA is disappointed there's been no substantial commitment to the implementation of any aspect of the aged care roadmap which proposed freeing up supply, etc. Alzheimer's Australia, disappointed again, said this. Tonight's federal budget contains no major policy or programs that would significantly improve the lives of more than 353,000 Australians living with dementia and their carers. What a disgrace this government is with respect to older Australians. It will take the election of a federal Labor government under Bill Shorten to address issues in relation to ageing and aged care to show Minister some vision for this expired. country. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the member for Hindmarsh. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. In the Hindmarsh electorate, I'm pleased to be able to work with local community groups regularly, whether it be attending their events or providing support through federal government programs and sponsorships. For Hindmarsh, the Stronger Communities program has been extremely helpful in providing assistance to clubs and organisations looking to improve facilities and amenities for the benefit of their members in the wider community. I'm always visiting the local groups and the electorate to meet the members, present Australian volunteer recognition certificates and witness firsthand the federal funding that is helping to grow clubs and organisations. Today I want to speak about a few of these major um, initiatives. The uh, Edwardstown Bowling Club is at one such group I've been pleased to see the benefit from the Stronger Communities program in round one, receiving over $9,000 to support the upgrade of their current lights on the green, allowing them to play well into the evening, especially in winter. And I've also supported the bowling club with a ramp so that some of their um, members with well, um, movement problems can, or challenges can uh, reach the green and uh, play um, to the best of their ability. So that disabled access ramp is proving a great win for the local club. And on a broader scale, the redevelopment of the Edwardstown Sports Complex is something that I've worked hard with local councillors and, uh, and others to try and get a good outcome for the local community and have better facilities in the future. In terms of other clubs, the Adelaide Sailing Club um, have received nearly $10,000 to out upgrade their outdoor amenities. Uh, having attended the Sailing Club opening days a num for a number of years, I can see that there's a great place for the club uh, members and also others of the community to, to get involved, whether it be sailing or just enjoy a fine meal down there by, by the water. Uh, West Beach Surf Life Saving Club is, is a club where um, I've got a lot of familiarity just down the road and where my children go uh, to 
to uh, engage in the Nippers program, and they're receiving some federal funding, um, which will help the club uh, patrol the beach for many years to come, uh, ensuring their emergency services products uh, remain safe and in good order. And they do a great job on many fronts. The West Beach Surf Life Saving Club, the Pink Swim uh, for the Breast Cancer Foundation is just one of, one of those. In terms of some other clubs that have been supported, the Glenelg Lacrosse Club, and I congratulate Steve Mortimer and his team on the lighting upgrade at Barrett Reserve at West Beach. The Glenelg Brass Band, who I saw on the weekend, uh, Bob Owen does a great job uh, ensuring that they have the necessary um, uh, or they're upgraded to their musical instruments, which is great, and they had many members of the public there supporting them on a Sunday afternoon. St Michael's and All Angels Netball Club, and, and they saw the Adelaide Thunderbirds netball team we just like, recently uh, train, and I congratulate George um, from Klimnos Pastries, who uh, helped facilitate that with myself and, and the <coughs> Thunderbirds. So thanks to everyone involved. It was great to see the girls um, learn from some of the best netballers in, in Australia. Uh, others to receive funding include the Glenelg Bowling Club for a kitchen upgrade, the Coptic Orthodox Church for the installation of in their community hall, and uh, the Rotary Club of West Lakes, who are working with the local council for a playground down at West Lakes Reserve. And in addition to this project, I understand the Rotary Club of West Lakes are working with other Rotary Clubs, whether it be Henley or Kimmon Park, on the carousel down at Semaphore Park, which provides great enjoyment for local families, especially children, on uh, many weekends and school holidays. The Adelaide University Hockey Club, um, almost 9,000 for an upgrade of their facilities. The Henley Football Club, one of the great, strong local amateur clubs in the South Australian Amateur Football League. Um, the uh, Fulham United Football Club, again, another lighting, uh, lighting upgrade for their facilities. And the soccer clubs around the districts, which are expanding in great numbers with um, more young girls in particular, and also young, young boys playing. Uh, they need support to upgrade their facilities. As we know that sporting clubs and registrations are becoming more expensive, so it's great that the federal government can get behind those clubs and help support improve their facilities. Uh, and uh, the Mycenaean Association of South Australia Incorporated and the soccer club that plays at King's Reserve at Theberton also receiving an upgrade to their, their kitchen. So um, it is a great program and there's so many great local organisations that are being receiving benefits. They've worked hard, they've worked well with me and my independent panel to uh, dis determine who receives support and I congratulate them all for the fine work they do on behalf of uh, the community and wish them all, their, all the best for their, their uh, work in the future. Thank the member for Hindmarsh. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Holt. Deputy Speaker, um, I rise also to speak about the Stronger Communities Grant program, which has provided well, much needed funding to local organisations in my federal electorate. The Holt Stronger Communities program aims to support local community groups and sporting organisations to provide funding for projects that will improve local community participation, cohesion, and contribute to vibrant and viable communities. Each project was considered by our Holt Stronger Communities Grant Committee, and uh, I'd like to thank the members, Leanne Petridis from the Cranbourne Information Support Service, Amanda Caron, Barry Rogers, Judy Owen, and Stephen Hallett for volunteering their time and assisting very assiduously in the assessment of each of the grants. In round one of the Holt Stronger Communities Grant um, applications that were submitted last year, we've had five projects approved by the Department of Infrastructure and Regional Development. One of the grants that was approved was for a $12,465 grant for the Narry Warren State Emergency Service Unit. And this unit is a very busy emergency service unit. The Vic SES Narry Warren received the grant to fund a kitchen replacement. This project will replace the existing kitchen area and will include the installation of new sinks, taps and wall units. The grant will assist the SES to increase the internal space in key areas of the building and provide a safing, uh, safer working area to cook and prepare meals. This grant is particularly welcome and a welcome funding boost for the Narry Warren SES, particularly given, as I said, the amount of work that they do. As example, by recent severe weather events in Melbourne, where they had 170 call-outs around the Narry South area on Saturday night, or particularly when we had the Hampton Park floods in 2011, when we had 600 residences flooded, we had 735 call-outs. So they are a very, very busy 
organisation full of good uh, volunteers that do uh, the necessary work to support and keep our community safe. Another uh, successful recipient was the Nan Kassar Thark Sikh Temple in Limbrook, which received over $5,000 to establish and, and to furnish a new community centre. This will include the purchase of new tables and chairs, laptops and shelves. Now, this community centre aims to equip the local migrant community, not just the Sikh community, with the tools and skills required to integrate with Australia's way of life, whilst maintaining a connection with the faith and the culture of the Sikh community and the migrant communities that access this particular facility. The Sikh temple plans to conduct information sessions in the community centre to educate migrants on how they can contribute to the wider society, these are their words, in a positive way as citizens, parents and individuals. As English is not the first language of many migrant families, English language and other lessons will provide essential skills to navigate day-to-day -day life in, um, in, and it helps to help navigate um, through the sort of sometimes Byzantine and complex systems of government agencies. I wanted to congratulate the Nankasar Thart Sikh Temple on receiving this grant. The Casey Life Church in Hampton Park, served beautifully well by Pastors Graham and Julie Shand, uh, also received um, $8,863 in a grant for the purchase of equipment to assist conducting iconic community events like the annual Hampton Park Carols by Candlelight each year. Now, this event has started small, but by, uh, last year we would have had about five to 6,000 people attend. And it was because of the work of the Casey Life Church that we're getting that building the community in the Hampton Park area, which has taken a number of hits over the past six to seven years. Uh, the project uh, will, that they will be given funding for the project to upgrade their existing sound system, amps and audio visual equipment and include the purchase of a digital sound desk, amplifier, wireless microphones and related equipment. Um, very deserving group of people. In addition, the St Paul Apostle Catholic Church has received a $5,000 grant for upgrading, upgrading their kitchen and meeting room appliances. This project will entail the purchase of a new stove, fridge, free and freezer. The project will also entail the purchasing of a new oven, microwave oven, hot water dispenser and television for the community meeting room. That church is used quite extensively by the Endeavour Hills community. The church kitchen is mainly used to prepare sandwiches and soup for distribution via a soup van that at present operates twice weekly to provide for local residents in need. So all in all, Deputy Speaker, um, very deserving organisations. The Southern Migrant Refugee Centre was another one that received funding out of round one. But there are many more organisations that have applied for round two. They are deserving organisations. These organisations are the lifeblood of the community. They provide much uncosted work to the community to keep our, the community ticking over. I'd like to thank everyone that participated in those community organisations and hope that a number of the other organisations that have applied for round two funding will be successful. I thank the member. The question is that the motion be agreed to and call the member for Capricornia. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Today I welcome the appointment of a central Queensland face onto the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility Board. Yapoon based Carla Way MacPhail was appointed to the seven member board which will supervise the rollout of the Northern Australia funding pool for major infrastructure. Mrs MacPhail is CEO of resource training company Coltrane based on the Capricorn Coast. As the local federal representative, I have been pushing for a central Queensland face on the board and Mrs MacPhail's appointment is very significant for Capricornia. The Capricornia community will benefit from the development of infrastructure in Northern Australia through the government's $5 billion Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility. It is the role of NAIF board to oversee aspects of this facility. Meanwhile, speaking of infrastructure, I am pleased to inform the House of progress that I and our coalition government are making positive progress in delivering serious and tangible infrastructure projects to my electorate of Capricornia. Deputy Speaker, I am proud to report that in the two and a half years that I have been working hard for Capricornia, I have helped to secure over $550 million in funding for infrastructure projects across the electorate. Such projects are designed to stimulate economic activity and employment. Recently, $20 million in new federal funding was announced for three key projects under the federal government's National Stronger Regions program. This includes $2.34 million for the Capricorn Rescue Helicopter Service to construct a new hangar and medical aviation centre in Rockhampton, 
We are providing $7 million towards the revamp and upgrade of the Rockhampton Riverbank development on the Fitzroy in the city's CBD. The funding will support the Rockhampton Regional Council project for better facilities and the opportunity for greater economic activity in the area. And we are providing $10 million towards stage four and five of the Yapoon Beachfront foreshore redevelopment on the Capricorn Coast as part of a major economic job creation and tourist draw card. Further to this, the federal government has partially contributed to the $12 million rebuild of the scenic highway or Statue Bay Road in Yapoon following Cyclone Marcia. $3 million to continue further rebuilding of Kershaw Gardens in Rockhampton and $5.2 million towards fixing storm water problems in Frenchville and York Street at Splitters Creek Crossing in Rockhampton. It also includes strengthening the rebuild of Pillbeam Drive, Glenmore Water Treatment Plant, Dean Street, Capricorn Street and Elphingstone Street in Rockhampton. The people of Frenchville and other parts of North Rockhampton deserve to have their problems fixed. And I am proud that this coalition government is chipping in. It is recognised that due to current mining downturn, the local economy in Capricornia is doing it tough. The $30 million investments in infrastructure I've just outlined will go a long way to stimulating economic activity and job potential in these areas. Our federal coalition government has already been investing heavily in road building projects to provide jobs to help offset the mining sector downturn. This includes $166 million to fix up the Eaton Range section on the notorious Peak Downs Highway west of Mackay, where work began in January. $38.26 million to replace seven old bridges in Isaac and Rockhampton Shires under the Federal Bridges Renewal Program. $8.5 million on overtaking lanes on the Bruce Highway near Serena. $15.5 million to construct three new overtaking lanes and to extend a fourth along the Bruce Highway from Rockhampton to north of Gladstone. $29.4 million in roads to recovery grants over five years to help fix up council roads and streets in five shires, including Rockhampton, Livingston, Isaac, Mackay and Whitsunday. And $136 million to complete the Stage 2 Yepin South floodplain project on the Bruce Highway south of Rockhampton, which opened in December. Further to this, we are improving mobile phone coverage in Capricornia with $3.14 million programmed to build or upgrade four new base stations, delivering better services to families in areas around Clark Creek, Marlborough, Mount Chalmers Road between Rockhampton and Yapoon and Gargit in the Pioneer Valley. Thank you. I thank the member for Capricornia. The question is that the motion be agreed to and call the member for Bendigo. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Bendigo electorate is a diverse electorate. It's a country electorate, so therefore takes in lots of smaller towns as well as a large population centre. But our diversity is also our strength. And I just wanted to place on the record and give a bit of a shout out to the many organisations that help make our part of the world a great place. Our volunteer organisations in the Macedon Rangers, Mount Alexander and Bendigo, the critical volunteers that help other volunteers connect with organisations. Next week is um, Volunteers Week in our part of the world. And it is disappointing that I leave this place to inform them that there's been a $12 million cut to support services via volunteer organisations in this budget. I'd like to give a shout out to our SES and, C and CFA, volunteer-based organisations that help make sure in emergency our, our homes and our roads are protected and safe. Unfortunately, this government's closure of the Australian Emergency Management Institute after their first budget has hurt the coordination and our ability to respond. And I hope that this won't continue into the future. Our environmental groups, and we have so many in central Victoria, that are connecting and switching to green energy. For example, MASH, based in Castle Maine, a bulk solar organisation purchasing bulk solar and helping to connect more homes, businesses and community organisations to green energy. And you can't go past the People's Republic of Newstead and their plan to go 100% renewable energy. 
Our small business organisations work hard to make sure that they're sharing networks and that they're supporting one another. And a big shout out to the organisations that I'm a member of, the Bendigo Business Council and Bendigo Networking. And I know they've been watching um, and listening to the detail of this budget. And the devil is in the detail of this budget. And they'll be concerned, like I am, that small business measures will be extended to include businesses of up to a billion dollars in turnover. There aren't too many small businesses in my part of the world that have that kind of turnover. Big shout out to the Believe in Bendigo crew, who, when our community was faced with a big challenge, stepped up to say, we believe in Bendigo. We are an inclusive and multicultural community. We donned on the yellow, we come together to celebrate our diverse cultures and to share them. To the businesses, the organisations, the councillors and my state colleagues, we came together under yellow to say we believed in Bendigo. And it was a moment for our community to say that we do not support the policies of the UPF, that we support our council and moving forward to be able to build our first mosque in Bendigo. A big shout out to our welfare and support organisations like the Salvation Army, like Uniting Care, um, like St Vincent's de Paul and organisations like Saltworks, who too have suffered under massive cuts by this government in their first, second and now third budget. They are still getting on to support the people in our community, the most vulnerable, despite having less funds to do so. And the Bendigo community have stepped up to help them. They say that demand for their services has increased by 30 per cent over the last three years, yet they have less support from this government, and that is where this government's priorities are wrong. To the schools in our electorate who are campaigning strongly for equity-based funding, I stand with you. Whether it be our smaller primary schools like Tarradale Primary School or Epilog Primary School, or our larger schools like Bendigo Senior Secondary. Every single school in the Bendigo electorate would have benefited from Gonski funding. So therefore, every school will suffer a cut because this government is not restoring the full Gonski funding in this budget. As I said, the strength of our community is our diversity. We do reach out to make sure that nobody is left behind. We are people that work together to grow our businesses, to make sure that nobody is left behind and to build a strong and inclusive community. The failure of this government is they've not got behind the people of Bendigo and Central Victoria. Their policies have failed to really understand what's going on. And one of the clearest areas where this government has failed and let people down is the workers of Bendigo. 85% of the workers of Bendigo earn less than $75,000 a year. And on budget night, this government said that they weren't entitled and didn't earn enough to get a tax cut. It's ridiculous to suggest that some of our lowest paid workers are not worthy of this kind of attention. The government has let Bendigo and Central Victoria Minister down. The time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Gilmore. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Working for the people and communities of Gilmore has been rewarding. Advocating for small and large allocations of funding for both new and continuing projects that risk being defunded. In total, I've delivered well over $350 million to Gilmore, and that doesn't include the almost half a billion defence investment in HMAS Albatross for the helicopter fleet acquisition and the helicopter aircrew training system. Incidentally, we almost lost this facility, but after a tip-off, I went straight to the minister and I argued to retain this development in Gilmore. Some of the significant funds and projects include the delivery of $51 million in infrastructure investment for roads safety packages, black spot funding, roads to recovery and heavy vehicle investment. 25 Green Army projects delivering environmental improvement, youth employment and training. More than $3 million invested in local business growth grants, training and upskilling and funding to accelerate commercialisation. The delivery of election promises, including $2 million for the Dunlewis Centre, the Kayama Harborside Works, the shared walkway construction in Vincentia, skate parks and CCTV installations. There have been dozens of smaller grants, such as saluting their service, the 2015 commemorative ANZAC grants and the Stronger Communities funds. I'm actually pretty good at getting jobs funded, but my reward is to see them completed. I just say, job done, now what's next? I'm not one to seek glory for every little issue, which for a politician isn't actually a really good idea because nobody really knows what you're doing. However, being a federal politician can also be personal. For example, when you're asked to intervene in the potential deportation of visa holders 
who employ eight Australians and have a BAS payment of about $35,000 a month, you call the minister and you fix it. Or when a local kitchen business is about to go belly up because an employee embezzled the company and the ATO is about to bankrupt them, you call the minister and you get it sorted. There are endless cases, many of them heartbreaking. It's been an honour to put my teaching and business experience to work as a community advocate while in government. I was part of the team lobbying for the Hep C cure to be put on the PBS, also for Kaleidico, a cure for some forms of cystic fibrosis. I lobbied the minister and was successful in the rollout of the shingles vaccine for people aged between 70 and 79. After November this year, they won't be paying the whopping $195. It's been terrific to assist community groups such as Taste of Paradise for their greenhouse, the Culburra Beach Skate Park, the Kiama Netball Association, Killerley Estate Park for the computers to help their Green Army team to get their white cards and learn to write CVs, the Sailing for Everyone Foundation for disability pontoon access for their boats, the Shell Harbour Surf Life Saving Club, the Sussex community with the help of council in getting funds for their learn to ride facility, Kids Corner and their great new outdoor play equipment, the Shoalhaven Community Transport Organisation for administration equipment and new instruments for our wonderful Shoalhaven Youth Orchestra, as well as a new floor and facilities for Ulladulla Children's Centre and most recently funds for the all-inclusive playground in Bait Haven. These are projects that really make a difference to those groups and to see the joy on their faces is inspirational. I'll continue to lobby and fight for the new Narra Bridge. It's an essential infrastructure linchpin for our residents our tourism growth, business expansion and consequential employment opportunities. I see youth who need to be part of our social fabric, rewarded for participation and taking on responsibility like the recently launched digital hub business, now funded for two years, and will assist around 120 people into work. I sponsored two participating businesses. I commend the initiative The Path Program, described just this week in the 2016 budget, for vulnerable young people having trouble breaking into the jobs market with solid preparation, assisted work trials while still receiving income support, taking that risk factor away from getting a job for a short time and struggling to get back into support if the job doesn't work out, and then having incentive payments for the employer. This has been a hard-won change and very welcome for the 12 per cent of our unemployed young people who do not have a working adult work role model in their home. It is transformational. Working for Gilmore and the residents has been an honour. And I hope to continue that advocacy in the next parliament, for we have only just begun to take advantage of the potential in our region, with the free trade agreements recently announced business incentives and a plan for economic stability to take Australia to a healthy financial future. We are setting ourselves up for a great plan for our children, our grandchildren, our businesses, jobs opportunities, and we can only say to our wineries, our seafood organisations, we have potential, we have great, great people, it's time to make the most of everything we have in Gilmore and keep it moving along. Thank the member for Gilmore. And the question is that the motion be agreed to. And I call the member for Karangamite. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise on what's expected to be the last day of this 44th parliament to stand up for a young woman and help her fight for justice. 32-year-old Megan McLeaning, a constituent of mine in Karangamite. In 2004, while studying in New Zealand as a young paramedic, Meg was brutally raped and abducted. The perpetrator, Akil Hassan Abbas al Baiti, was an Iraqi asylum seeker who had been granted New Zealand citizenship. At the time he attacked Meg, he was on parole for raping two other women and attempting to rape a third woman for which he was jailed for nine years in 1998. The New Zealand government subsequently revoked his citizenship. Meg's attacker was convicted and sentenced for abduction and rape for what he did to Meg in 2005 for seven years and is on preventative detention. Like the man who killed Jill Ma in Brunswick, that absolutely shocking case, Mr Deputy Speaker, Megan McLean's attacker should, should not have been out on parole. He was a monster. Meg is still living with trauma and with terrible internal injuries she suffered, injuries that I'm not able to speak about. Each year, Meg is required to travel to New Zealand 
to give evidence to the New Zealand Parole Board in order to ensure this perpetrator is not released. Meg is now a paramedic. She's married with two children, pregnant with her third. And she, uh, despite the incredible struggles that she faces every day, she's doing an amazing job coping. She did receive some initial compensation, but the fact is that she's incurred tens of thousands of dollars of medical bills, which has left her and her family under severe financial stress. I have made various representations to our government on behalf of Meg, and I want to thank the Foreign Minister for taking this matter up with the New Zealand government. The Foreign Minister wrote to the New Zealand Minister responsible for the Accident Compensation Corporation in New Zealand, uh, seeking financial support and help to assist Meg with her rehabilitation. However, Mr Deputy Speaker, a key issue is that there is a statutory ban on the ACC, the compensation body in New Zealand, paying for overseas re rehabilitation. Uh, section 128 of the Accident Compensation Act 2001 um, particularly limits uh, this payment of rehabilitation outside of New Zealand. And there's only a very limited exception relating to the provision of attendant care. Today, as part of this fight for justice, I call on the New Zealand government to overturn this ban so that Australian victims of crime in New Zealand are able to receive ongoing treatment for injuries that they suffer, suffered in New Zealand and are now paying the price for in Australia. The Australian-New Zealand relationship is a very special one. And when Australians suffer, as Meg McLean has suffered so terribly, our close neighbour and very close friend must stand by us. The New Zealand justice system has badly failed Meg and now we need to ensure that this wrong is righted. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for Karangamai. The question is that the motion be agreed to, and I call the member for Kennedy. Uh, <coughs> Speaker, this is the third speech in a series. Um, the federal government has made enormous noise about developing Northern Australia, and they have the ignominy of going into this election having done absolutely nothing. Not one cent of money allocated, not one single job. And also having spent, uh, as far as we can make out, another $20 million on looking into us. Now we spent 200 mi over 200 million on looking into us, and in terms of today's money, some of that goes back about 15 years, um, um, <clears throat> close to 300 million in looking into us. Well, as the famous Pajocki Peterson said on numerous occasions, if you can't make a decision, get to hell out of the cabinet room. This place is for decision makers, not for looking into us and mirror men. Mr. Uh, um, Acting Speaker, if that's the correct term, uh, sir. Deputy, um, Deputy Speaker. The Galilee Basin has half of Australia's known coal reserves. It is a treasure trove of massive proportion. For those that see no future in coal-fired uh, power stations, let me just correct you and say the problem is CO2, BHP, Ergon, the big electricity supplier in Queensland, and CSIRO have already established that all of your CO2 emissions can be absorbed in ponded areas so that the modern power station will have no <clears throat> um, CO2 emissions whatsoever. When it goes into the pond, it grows algae, which is of fabulous value to the cattle industry. It is 23 per cent protein, which is extraordinarily high. Um, what we need in the Galilee is the building of a railway line. And the railway, first railway line was built in Queensland in the uh, 1960s when Australia was a coal importing country. Can you imagine convincing the public that we could go from a coal importing country to being a coal exporting country? And upon that gamble, one and a half thousand million dollars of public funds was committed from a budget of 3,000 million 
dollars. <laughs> I'm using today's terms. Uh, um, it was uh, um, probably predated even dollar currency, Mr. Speaker. So they, the Queensland government then proceeded over the next 20 or 30 years to lay down 6,000 kilometres of coal line. Now, the coal industry has gone backwards now for about uh, seven or eight years. Uh, in the 25 years since the country party, then calling themselves the National Party, was knocked over in 1990, in that 25 years, to my knowledge, there's not been a single kilometre of rail line put down. Now, the Adani Mining Company has said they're going to produce three, four, five thousand million dollars worth of coal annually, uh, and they need the railway line. They have been struggling now for three years to overcome 400 hurdles to get the railway line built. If the railway line is built, then the Australian economy benefits to the tune of somewhere between four and seven thousand million dollars a year. That is assuming that only Adani goes on stream. Now, what in heaven's name are we fooling around with? There are no hurdles for a government initiative, none whatsoever. So build the railway line. It's 2,000 million. Build Hell's Gates Dam. Heaven only knows. Government has had, did a study on it about every five or six years now, uh, back to 1984, when uh, the giant Bradfield scheme was announced, and this is the major component of that scheme. Now, we're not advocating Bradfield. I'd love to, but I'm not doing that. I'm just saying build hell's guts. That will give you your, your economy and income of 2,000 million a year. So 7,000 million from the Galilee, 2,000 million from hell's guts. Above hell's guts, which is just southwest of Townsville, Charters Towers, if you like, uh, southwest of Cairns, um, um, Ravenshoe, if you like, uh, is the giant status proposal on the Upper Herbert River, which again will give you another $1,000, $2,000 million a year in income. Build a canal to get our fertiliser out, which is probably about $200 million is all we require there, and, and we will give you back $4,000 million a year in fertiliser production. We're already doing nearly $2,000 million in Mount Isa now, Mr Acting Speaker. So all these wonderful things and, and a the, the realisation of what we should be achieving in, in the cattle industry, which is a quadrupling of our present the, the figures members with irrigation. Time, the member's time, <coughs> Thank Mr Spider. You Thank the member for Kennedy. Uh, I move now, although the question is that the Federation Chamber do now adjourn. All those opinion, please say aye. All those aye. against, no. I think the ayes have it. The Federation Chamber therefore stands adjourned until 10.30am on Monday the 9th of May 2016.